We've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. So I think that gives some room for a broadening out of the market. I'm bullish on equities. I think we're going to have a bullish broadening. You want to be selective, even within what appears to be a nicely broadening rally. I think the prospects for growth here, while not boomy, look reasonably good. I don't think that you can have the kind of growth that we've had, given the kind of economic backdrop that we're looking at. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brown with some Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P pulling back again, this time by 0.2% on the S&P. Last year's big winners, TK, some of yesterday's big losers, turning 2023 upside down to start the new year. Let's go technical, and we're nowhere near support right now. We pulled back yesterday. I noticed, John, as you did, and Lisa, I think, led on this, frankly. There's a fair amount of hysterics out there about a first day omg the worst since time began it was a biblical proportions you look at any chart right now i've got two standard deviations spx up we're nowhere near a center tendency of support i'm going to call it 4600 we're not there headline this morning mass kettner hsbc <clears throat> with this one bramo cut stocks cut credit Go to cash. That's a big change from Max to start That's a new year. Huge. Yeah, who has been basically talking about Goldilocks and go heavily into risk all of last year, even when other people were uh, bearish. Why? And this is, to me, the most interesting part. Is it because he actually sees earnings going down or there not being this disinflationary <coughs> trend? No. What's the fly in the ointment, he said? <coughs> Sentiment and positioning. That's the entirety of it, and that seems to be the anti-Goldilocks. Yeah, and, and Tony morning. Dwyer at Canagord, I mentioned this yesterday, talking, using the word giddy. Maybe it's not as eloquent as Max Kettner, but it's the same idea. There's an effervescence. To Lisa's point, reverse Goldilocks is what Max is looking for now. This line jumped off the page to me. We continue to believe that from a multi-asset perspective, the biggest risk is not from a sudden deterioration, but another repricing in rates. TK, that final point, a big point. Yeah, the repricing in rates is there, and it's percolating this morning. Antoine Garo over at the FT killing it on an analysis of private equity and private credit. And their struggle with the new rate regime, yeah, we got a breathtaking fourth quarter, you know, things got better. But what if we reverse? No one's really framed that out. That's almost like a Jim. You talked to Bianco yesterday, right? Bianco did the Jim same B thing, yeah. What did Jim Bianco say What's about What's the pain trade of 2024? What will yeah. it be? And this is guessing, but ultimately he thinks it could yeah. be another repricing in rates, which is what you hear from yeah. Max Kettner this morning. Bramo, next stop, Fed minutes. Did they, didn't they discuss cutting interest rates sometime soon? I mean, first of all, does it matter? Because frankly, <clears throat> how much credibility does this have? What I find more interesting is the market reaction. How much are people poised to sell bonds if there is any pushback whatsoever of possibly cutting rates this year? I will just say that right now, even Neil Dutta, who has been talking about this immaculate disinflation, came out yesterday and said, Six cuts seems like too many. Everyone's pushing back. So this is sort of the sober January as everyone comes back, reassesses, okay, our adults in the room, let's get back to work. This seems a little over the skis. A sober January on Wall Street. <laughs> Something like that. That's what this is. Okay. <laughs> Yields pushing higher again this morning. Here's the price action for you. Yields up by two or three basis points on a two-year, on a 10-year by three or four to 396.68. Equity futures lower, negative by 0.2%. I talked about turning 2023 upside down to start 2024. Lisa, you saw that in foreign exchange as well. Yeah, you saw the biggest uh, rally in the dollar going back to March again, this sort of retracing of some of the trades from last year, especially because people were basically saying that the ECB wouldn't really have to cut rates and people are now saying, yeah, right. All right, here's what we're watching today. 8.30 a.m., Richmond Fed President Tom Burkett is speaking to the Raleigh Chamber of Commerce. Does he push back against rate cutting? Does he lead into some of the softness that we're seeing? 10 a.m., we get ISM manufacturing and jolts job openings. ISM manufacturing, I know that, John, you've been really in on this and the fact that we've seen a steady contractionary state in manufacturing since October of 2022, more than a year, really speaks to the disinflation in goods, not services, that has driven some of the recent sentiment. At 2 p.m., it is the FOMC a meeting minutes. Did they, didn't they, does it matter? What it matters is how much does the market reprice to any assumption that the Fed doesn't want the market to price in six cuts, right? I mean, 
that to me is how much do people have a trigger finger, a trigger finger to sell bonds in response to any pushback? What's this one doing at 2 p.m. Eastern time? He's sleeping. I'm, I'm, reading, reading, Cam I'm reading Cameron Dawson's research note at 2 p.m. Okay. this afternoon. Mm, sure you are. Cameron sure. Dawson joins us now, Chief <clears throat> Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. Cameron, good morning and happy new year. Good morning. Happy new year. Are you sitting on the fence? Because I'm reading this first line in your work. It says <laughs> we could have a scenario where both bulls and bears are right <laughs> this year. Which one is it? Well, I think that we have to be nimble because I believe that there is going to be a scenario where you could very easily see people get drawn even further into this market. We think positioning is overweight, but not quite as extreme as it was in times like 2021 or 2018. So you could see some pain get pulled in. But the other reality is that you could see a rationalization of the fact that sentiment is very extended and that valuations are extended. So it's how you react to market rallies or market corrections, I think, is how you will win in 2024. We mentioned HSBC. So let's talk about the work coming from Max Kettner this morning. Here's this line. Biggest risk, another repricing in rates. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. That's the pain trade. The pain trade is that everybody thinks that inflation is fully vanquished and then gets surprised if things like oil prices move higher, wages end up being stickier than expected, rates move higher, and then all of those stocks that re-rated in the last two months up 30, 40 percent because now they're not worried about their balance sheets anymore, balance sheet risk becomes an issue again and you get a reversion of a lot of the names that were lower quality that happened to lead at the end of last year. The modeled out earnings are 9 percent, 10 percent, dare I say double digit 11 percent earnings growth for this year. Is that in the price now? Or is that going to develop out in the first half of next year? It is in the price now. And I think that we always have to think about the path of 24 will be pricing in what actually happens in 2025. So if a recession looks more likely in 2025, that's when you'll start to see those earnings estimates get cut into the out years. The thing that's the biggest challenge for us for earnings estimates in 24 is the expectation that top line growth will re-accelerate in a year where nominal growth because of inflation is expected to decelerate. Can you see that happen at the same time where we get less inflation, totally less pricing power, right. and yet we get a big acceleration in top line? So away from the romance of Apple and Microsoft, if you look at staples and discretionary and all, you, you've got a model out there, what? You go back from a 6% wonderment of growth back to 4% revenue growth? Yeah, very likely. And there are idiosyncratic pockets yeah, where right. you're going to see improvement. You know, healthcare had its earnings down almost 20% last year. That will flip positive this year just because of easy comps. So that's where we're trying to look outside of just the, the, the macro drivers, Staples being a great example of one that can't get away from this inflationary dynamic and look instead to the more idiosyncratic opportunities. Are banks idiosyncratic opportunities? <laughs> I ask with JP Morgan at new record highs. Yeah, I mean, you've seen such a huge re-rating. Of course, there's pockets of banks where there is still inexpensive areas. You know, banks do have the tailwind of a less inverted curve, hopefully a reopening of capital markets. But then we have to consider things like BTFP, does it get re-extended, Basel III Endgame, all of these things that could be big drivers of bank earnings or at least appetite for bank risk as we go through 2024. It sounds like you're not buying the rotation story. I am buying the rotation story. Yeah, I, I think that we have to have an open mind that even great companies with great balance sheets, with near monopolies, could still underperform simply because positioning is so crowded and because right. valuations are so elevated. That's the smartest insight I've heard in the last 48 hours. Are we going to have rotation or not? That's a really, really undersaid well, question. I think that that was really some of the angst behind the sell-off that we've seen yeah. that was living, uh, that was really led by big tech. We were talking about this yesterday with Apple, and I guess that you know how much does that have legs versus what we saw last year, which was a head fake, and everyone came in saying, "All right, this is the year to sell tech." And by the end of the year, everyone was saying, "Nvidia, Magnificent Seven, it's going to change the world. Kumbaya, it's going to save the United States." I mean, et cetera, et cetera. And what a different setup, because at the very end of 20. 2022, you had record outflows from tech ETFs. You look at the course of 2023, you had $40 billion of inflows into technology compared to $20 billion of outflows out of things like energy and financials and healthcare. So really, this could just be about positioning and pain trades and the fact that you already re-rated tech because now it's already just one turn away from its 2021 peak valuation. So you're hitting a ceiling. Let's put a couple of stories together. You said maybe the biggest pain trade. The risk here is higher rates, the repricing of rates again. Lisa brought up banks. How would the banks respond to that? 
given what we saw last year? Yeah, I mean, it, it would raise balance sheet risk again. It probably puts into sharp focus again issues with commercial real estate because we've all kind of breathed this collective sigh of relief that higher for longer is dead. If it's not dead and the path of the cost of capital instead of the last 40 years of being down is actually marching slightly higher and in a, you know, in a choppy path could mean that we have to reprice some of the risk in some of these balance sheets. Is it just JP Morgan then everyone else? <laughs> when we talk about the banks, is that what we're talking about? JP Morgan then everybody else? We actually just are looking very deeply at some of the regional banks. Some of the regional banks are underpriced, we think. If we look at the balance sheets, they're not as extended as, uh, or as issued as some parts of regional banks that some don't have as much commercial real estate exposure, have great presence in their local areas. So they're trading at very discounted valuations. If we're going down in value, that's one of the areas we're actually looking. Yeah, but somebody had over, you know, the last five, six, seven days at JP Morgan's capturing one out of five profit dollars <laughs> in American banking. If that isn't the third or fourth or fifth national bank of the United States, I don't know what is. I there mean, is nothing else. It's JP Morgan versus everyone else. That's been a story the last year. I'll defer to our guest on this, but yeah, I mean, they're capturing some 20% of profits according to the source. I'm sorry, I don't have the source in front of me to cite. I think it's the, it's the, it's the Bramo newsletter. You know that newsletters. It's a must read. It's a must read. Cameron, thank you. Got to leave it there. It's good to catch yeah. up. It's good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy Cameron New Dawson there of New Edge Wealth. Pushing forward, Lisa mentioned Fed minutes and some data coming out a little bit later. We need to talk about Friday as well. Let's have a little chat, a conversation about payrolls. Here are the estimates so far for payrolls at the moment. non farm payrolls, median estimate in our survey. As always, this can change going into the number, but a survey so far gives you a median estimate of 170 on unemployment 3.8 percent here's the view from goldman 190 on payrolls at least a 3.7 percent on unemployment so if you're looking for a slowdown in the labor market in the broader economy doesn't scream slow down does it bramo doesn't scream it well this is exactly the reason why repricing and rates seems to be the biggest potential risk for a lot of people because does this type of labor market really represent a consistently disinflationary environment when you've got wage inflation running at about four percent year over year that's also what we're looking at this to me the underpinnings of just how much average hourly or a weeks uh, his earnings are really coming down whether we're actually seeing the unemployment rate rise we saw actually uh, re, uh, reissued lower than it had been before. All of these things really paint to the fear that we could potentially get either sticky inflation or even a tick back up in uh, how much prices are increasing. I looked at a four-week moving average of weekly claims. I don't use it as much as I use the Friday data, but tomorrow and Thursday, today's Wednesday, right? Tomorrow and Thursday, look at the claims to see when do we finally get the lift up off of about 211,000. I mean, that it, it, five years ago, John, if you said 211,000, that's a gift from God. Look, claims, that was the guide for 2023, I think. And Lisa mentioned the manufacturing guy, Sam, and right to point out that it's been sub 50 since late 2022. So it's been in contraction territory. That tells you something about manufacturing. Of course, it's worth still having a look at, but ultimately it didn't tell you what was happening elsewhere in the US economy. Yeah. And Lisa, if you just focused on claims, in and around 200K, that just spoke to the resilience and sometimes the strength of the US economy through last year. And this is a reason why Nathan Sheets pointed to this divergence, that a lot of the disinflation has been driven by goods disinflation. He put out a note uh, yesterday basically saying uh, that right now, given where service inflation is running, it's around 4%, and it's way above where yeah. the Fed would need it to be. This is the reason why people are worried about that stickiness. John, I go to the ECI year over year. This is wages and benefits combined. It's just one of many statistics. And the answer is normals two and a half, three percent. We went up to five percent. We've only rolled over to just about four percent. We got a ways to go to bring wage inflation down. The Fed speakers data. taking a day off, Tom. You noticed that? I'm just looking on the calendar. Yeah, well, they're probably waiting for the five year auction. Off. No, Tom Barkin. Barkin's he's getting speaking. Back to work. He's speaking twice this today. Okay. Twice so he's today. Really, he's I've representing got Logan, Logan and yeah. Bostick. Well, you know, yeah. they're starting the year Just slow. Just a quiet start. Maybe. Okay. We might add some in there. Do they have like non-voter day where on one day all the non-voters speak? And people don't listen? Or Tom they? Barkin. Well, it'll listen okay. anyways. Right. But. Tom Barkin's a voter. Just want to say. Voting yes, member. Yes. There we New go. round of voting members. Yes. We can talk Goolsby, about. I think, is off. He's been silenced. Mm, okay. He's been I muscled. doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> Coming up in the next hour, Tracy McMillian of the Wells Fargo Investment Institute to weigh in on all of this. To kick off your training day, equity futures pulling back just a touch, adding to the losses of yesterday. We're negative 0.2% on the S&P from New York this morning. Good morning.
The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. The president has said we are we are ready to act in self-defense if needed. I'm certainly not going to get into specifics of our uh, military operations, but the president is always and has always been committed uh, to our service member and protecting the, our service member uh, abroad. And that's what the president's going to be committed to. That was White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre speaking on ABC yesterday as the <clears throat> Biden administration looks to defend against Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. The latest this morning, TK, according to Hamas, a senior leader killed by Israel in an explosion in Beirut, raising fresh concerns, of course, about a regional conflict taking place. Not the time for a civics lesson on the distinction between Hezbollah and Hamas, but the answer is this is a triangulation Lisa talked about uh, on January, uh, December 7th, whatever the date was uh, here in Israel. And, and, and that is this is triangulation between Gaza, the West Bank, and now up to the northern border in Lebanon. It's a long ways away from Gaza. If we're worried about escalation, we're not seeing a big move in the commodity market. Let's get up the screen and go through the board together. CUR. Starting with Brent and WTI. WTI actually down on the day now. Negative on the session by 0.2%. Lisa, $70.25. Brent crude basically unchanged, $75.90. And we felt this tension yesterday where initially crude popped in response to uh, Iran sending a warship over to the Red Sea. And then the risk aversion took hold. So here's the question. Does that reverse at some point or really is the risk aversion and incredible supply from the U.S. going to dominate in an otherwise somnolent commodity market? It's really surprising. To your point, Bramo, yesterday crude was up close to 3% at one point. Tom, end of the day down by almost two. Yeah, I, I thought the under 70, now $70.27 on West Texas Intermediate, but the 69 at print in the blur of yesterday, you know, the enthusiasm about a tough stock market and what bonds did uh, to see oil pull back, I think is notable. I mean, it's all there is uh, to it. Joining us now on our many politics, Terry Haynes. He's founder of Pangea uh, Policy. Terry, I, I don't mean to make light of this because these are tragic fronts but you say to the cliche, we are all quiet on multiple fronts. Is America ready for multiple fronts of defense and offense in military, Taiwan, Ukraine, and what we see in the Eastern Mediterranean? Um, I, think, uh, I, I think there are two answers to that, and they, they, both of them start with no. Uh, one is the level of actual preparedness to be able to be what Franklin Roosevelt used to call the arsenal of democracy. I think the answer to that is no. I get a lot of backup on that, uh, positive backup on that in markets. Uh, the other sense is, uh, are, they, are, are we emotionally ready for that? I don't think that's the case either. I don't think uh, the, either in the public or in markets, frankly, uh, there's an understanding of just exactly what needs to happen and how. Uh, if we were actually working on this to the, the degree that we need to in three regional conflicts and potentially more, we'd probably be invoking the Defense Production Act. And the yeah. president has not invoked that uh, for defense. Oh. He's invoked it for a lot of other things, but the, not for defense. The World Bank keeps score on this. I got 33% as a defense to GDP in war-driven Ukraine. Here it's 3.5%. Granted, it's higher than many others. But is the basic idea in Washington we're spending enough on our multiple military efforts? Uh, the basic idea in Washington is that we ought to be as, as spending as much as we are. And, you, and uh, that's, that seems circular because it is. Uh, what we've got is a situation where uh, you know, the, the back and forth over budgeting and what we're actually going to spend uh, in defense, what that comes around to is are we going to maintain current levels uh, of spending or are we not? Generally speaking, we're going to maintain current levels. Uh, but if you think responding to a threat means uh, spending more money on it, as Washington usually does on other areas, I don't see that in defense. At this point, given everything that's going on internationally, how much are people paying attention to uh, January 15th and the Iowa Republican caucus? 
Oh, I think they're paying a great deal of attention to it. You know, you've got a uh, you know, you've got a, a, a sort of a tumbling series of events that are going to happen uh, in both internationally and domestically to kind of shake people out of their torpor here uh, post holiday. Uh, the domestic event, I think, certainly will be the Iowa caucuses because then we'll figure out whether Trump supporters are, are more energized or more fatigued by everything that's been going on. Uh, internationally, I think we kick off with the uh, with the Taiwanese elections, uh, which stand to, to create additional market jitters. Frankly, no matter what happens, if uh, the independence candidate wins, then. Uh, you know, China will bear its teeth even more. But if the independence, if, excuse me, if the uh, uh, more assimilation uh, based candidates win, uh, then people are going to be confused about what comes next. So either way, it's going to be a problem. You said that people have been a bit complacent about some of the political risks. This always mm -hmm. seems to be the charge that markets need to wake up to the political risk and then uh, politics happen and markets go the opposite direction of what everyone thinks and then can realize that they absolutely should have ignored it. Why is this time yeah. different? that people should be paying attention and how should they be paying attention from a market perspective? My point's real simple, which is that uh, there, there are two things uh, that related to this that underpin markets. Uh, one is uh, geopolitical risk. The other one is U.S. domestic risk. Markets have been so used to for so many years, uh, 50 years, 60 years or more, uh, for the, the the idea that there's going to be relatively stable U.S. politics and there's going to be relatively stable geopolitics uh, that they've forgotten or never experienced a time when neither or both of those was true. Uh, and my concern is that uh, we're, we, we may be approaching that domestically. I think we're certainly approaching that uh, geopolitically with all the, uh, yeah. uh, all the potential problems that exist. Terry, stagger on from Iowa to New Hampshire to March 5th. I believe we're going to have a Super Tuesday there this year, maybe not, when we get out to October, the conventions before that, et cetera. Does any of this talk matter, or do we vote domestic policies? Uh, right now, I think we vote more than anything else. We vote domestic policies. Uh, you know, the, the concern about people hitting uh, hit the policies, hitting them in their pocketbooks. And uh, Bloomberg has done some excellent work on this as to why the uh, uh, why we should take people's inflation concerns seriously. But beyond that, you know, the um, Suffusing everything else is a concern uh, in the in the public that uh, we're not responding well enough to uh, to foreign crises, and we're a bit uh, we're a bit a step behind. And the question of whether the Biden administration is going to be up to it, firstly, and secondly, uh, whether the alternative uh, vote, uh, whether it be for a Republican or a third party candidate, uh, feels like an improvement, I think is also going to be important. Hey, Terry, appreciate the update. Happy New Year, sir. It's good to hear from you. Happy Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. Just to push forward through the rest of the program this morning, Dan Ives of Wedbush is going to join us in about 20 minutes time on a big move lower yesterday in Apple. On a move higher, JP Morgan, all time highs that are closed yesterday. Lisa, we'll catch up with Jared Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets at about 7.45 Eastern time. I'm so looking forward to this conversation, not only because JP Morgan was at record highs, but Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo yesterday came on Bloomberg Television and was talking up Citigroup, saying he expects the shares to double and triple over the next three years, profits to, to double uh, in that time period. At this point, even Cameron Dawson talking about she's looking at regionals and sort of buy the dip in banks after a pretty brutal year for everyone. I, I just wonder where the roll up is. I mean, I understand the major banks can't buy anything. They can only buy something when it's in crisis. See Silicon Valley and, and Republican, all the first Republican, all that. But to Cameron's good point, let's go. I've been saying let's go for what? Five, six. Last time the Red Sox won. I mean, it's it's a long time. Last time the Tots won. That's been a long they've time. They've been ago. winning. They, well, they've been winning, but they've mm. been winning like Liverpool winning. Well, you say let's go, but stocks have been going. So we've got the regional banks up in November of by almost 14 oh, percent. Regional banks yeah. up in December by almost 16 plus percent. I'm just when are they going to merge? When, when are we going to get scale? Scale is, is, you know, that's that's the word. There also is the Apollo in the room, right? The Aries in the room. This is sort of the question around private uh, credit, private uh, equity, all of these behemoths that have all of these money pools and tons of investors and locked up capital that are eating the lunch of the big banks. How do they compete if they yeah. have to pay yeah. people big bucks Front to come in and really lead a similar effort? Two Fridays away. Earnings from JP Morgan, put that in the diary, January 12. 
February 2nd for Apple, early February. So that's a slate of things, two names for you to put in the diary over the next couple of weeks. That's what's coming up on the calendar. Coming up next on this program, Constant Hunter of Macro Policy Perspectives on this economy. Looking ahead to Fed Minutes later this afternoon. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York, here's the price action for you on the S&P, on the Nasdaq. Equity futures looking like this. We're negative 0.3% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 0.4. The small caps pulling back by almost three quarters of 1%. The Nasdaq with the biggest one-day loss since October, which incidentally was the last time we had a weekly loss in this equity market on the S&P 500. So the Nasdaq turning things upside down <coughs> from the end of 2023. Big gains turn into some marginal losses for the equity market. And just throwing some fuel on the fire. Max Kettner this morning of HSBC. Some interesting calls to start the year. Yesterday, a downgrade on Apple from equal weight to underweight over at Barclays. This morning, HSBC, Lisa, cunning stocks, cunning credit, going to cash. Because of sentiment, because of positioning, talking about reverse Goldilocks at a time where everyone had already priced in all the good news. Now the good news might overwhelm some of the dampening effect on yields. And that seems to be what people are focused on this morning. The risk of a repricing in rates. So let's talk about the bond market. Chop it up two year, 10 year, 30 year. Looks like this on a two year right now, higher by <coughs> three basis points to three, 434.92. Tom on a 10 year, 397.06 yeah. this morning. Yields higher by four basis points. Into the economic data that we have, the 10 year real yield 1.75 percent and I, I i went back and looked at just some moving average studies and there's a level there at 1.60 a level below that at 1.20 and too many guests have suggested we tendency back to 1.60 i wonder how desperate part of financial global financial wall street is to get the real rate back down. I think that's a real desirable goal. Right so now. that's the bond market, Tom. So you remember November, December yields lower, more recently yields higher than November, December <clears throat> equities rallying the last 24 hours, equities lower through last year. First down day for the US dollar since 2020. Guess what happened yesterday? <coughs> Lisa, just the whole of last year in reverse. But very small moves, of course. The US dollar shown some strength again this morning. The euro against the dollar, 109.20. It was the biggest move for the dollar, the biggest strengthening move, I believe, going back to March. So we really saw a significant shift as people thought maybe the US economy doing better than Europe actually matters for something at a time where people discounted the ECB uh, actually following through with rate cuts because they believed <coughs> them for some reason. I think that was a yawn from TK. I know, I saw about that. Foreign exchange. That, was, that was a That's really foreign exchange. Exchange. Have you, you to caught sleep? up with your sleep yet? <laughs> I mean, I, I got to catch from up on my sleep from, yeah. from, from the vacation. To walk through that. You know, I, I, I'm just trying to get January vacation 3. Vacation makes you tired. I'm think, yeah, I'm okay. thinking like January 5, January 6, we may find stability. A dollar index showing a bit of strength, <laughs> positive by 0.3%. Let's get you some top stories under surveillance this morning. Harvard's Claudine Gay stepping down as president following controversy over anti-Semitism on campus and accusations of plagiarism. <laughs> Gay writing in a statement, it is in the best interest of Harvard for me to resign so that our community can navigate this moment of extraordinary challenge. Lisa, with a focus on the institution rather than an individual. And a lot of people saying that this came as a result of plagiarism accusations, less some of the testimony to Congress around uh, how the school was going to respond to anti-Semitism. The bigger question here is, what is free speech on college campuses? How are people going to foster a true uh, platform where people on all sides can really air their discussions without pressure on one side or another to uh, be silenced? And this, to me, is the discussion that yeah. we're not hearing loud enough from some of these colleges how they're going to move forward on that level. If somebody said to me, what are the five most important conversations of 2023? There's Mark Rowan of Apollo coming off the dinner of the UJA in New York, which he hedged, which he spirits, talking about his University of Pennsylvania. My guess is, John, this doesn't end with a Harvard. The billionaires out there, the philanthropists of these schools, they're looking at this school by school. Yeah, but we shouldn't just make this about rich guys taking on leaders at universities. This is about something much, much bigger than that. Sure. Lisa, you mentioned what this is all about, free speech. And what we've seen on campus over the last 10 years, in the words of Mark Rowan of Apollo, preferred speech, not free speech. And to your point, they've got to figure this out. 
and, and figure it out fast. And frankly, that's what interests me more, because if it's just people pulling their, <coughs> their, uh, their checkbooks away from the colleges, that's not free speech yep. either, right? That's, right? So at this point, how do you have a conversation about what is truly a okay. way to enable a diversity of thought without penalizing people, you know, shadow banning, So what's doxing? the formula at your University of Chicago? They, the, the acclaim nationwide is Chicago has nailed this discussion. Why are they different than the other schools? Well, there's a history of uh, not necessarily having a partisan take, but also there is no university stance on any political issue. They do not come out and say, we stand with this, we stand mm -hmm. with that. And so they didn't have to come out and take a stance. Everybody speaks for themselves and people can have independent opinions. And more on that story a little bit later. Let's get you the next story. New concerns of a wider conflict after a senior Hamas leader was killed in Lebanon's capital of <coughs> Beirut. Six in total are dead after a drone strike in a city suburb yesterday. This marks the most senior Hamas leader believed to be killed by Israel, at least since the attacks on October and people talking about the potential for escalation, although there hasn't necessarily been any kind of response. Look, this is exactly what Israel said they were going to do. They were going to go find the different Hamas leaders in the different nations and take them out. So here's the question. If nobody from Hezbollah was killed, if it was three people who were killed and they were largely connected to Hamas, is Lebanon going to respond, given what happened with the Lebanese war? I mean, these are some of the reasons why people maybe aren't paying as much attention to this as a possible escalation. This has been the big question, I think, Tom, over the last two months, the prospect of this spilling over to other places, yeah. to Lebanon, to Iran, to elsewhere. Yes, no, we mentioned it here 20 minutes ago, but yes, the geography of Israel goes from the south up to the east and then up to the north in Lebanon. We promised you updates on this story, so here is your update on it. Investigators confirming a Japan Airlines flight was cleared to land before crashing into a Coast Guard plane <coughs> at Tokyo's Haneda Airport yesterday. All passengers aboard the Airbus airliner were able to escape as the jet burst into flames. Five crew members on the Coast Guard plane were killed. Elisa, the accident still under investigation. All I can say is when you read the stories of survival of the people who are on that plane and what the crew members on the plane, on the passenger plane, did to get them out, they deserve a medal, honestly. You know the video that we all ignore the place before the start of a yeah, flight? Yeah. yeah, I think you should probably pay attention to that. <laughs> you know, all right. this, the no you joke to actually read those, those sort of uh, extra strategies? Seriously, given the near misses we've had in this country, yeah. in America, what took place in Japan in the last 24 hours isn't that the ultimate fear, Tom, here in America, based on what yeah, we've heard no from several reports I mean, across airports in this country? You're more eloquent than I am. I alluded to it yesterday. I thought I was pretty clumsy about it, but you nail it. It's a really, it is an American thing. Frankly, I think it's a European thing as well. These are a huge, huge, intractable budgetary issues. This is about spending money. That, that investigation continues, that. Tom, but I think elsewhere that's a tragic wake-up call for a lot of people elsewhere too. On the American economy right now, Constant Hunter joins us working with Julia Coronado, Macro Policy Perspective. She is a senior a advisor. Constance, I love your note where you fold in our economics within our finance. How linked right now is the economics of Coronado and Hunter to what we see in the stock market? Well, and they're in, they're linked because obviously, they're, as you were talking about earlier, they're linked because of what's going on in bond prices. They're linked because we have, um, we saw a pullback in wealth, of course, in the third quarter, expectations of an increase in the fourth quarter. This impacts how people feel about the economy, it impacts how they're going to spend. And of course, that is the big question. So sort of what right. happens with the, that, that intersection of weaker economy, lower uh, inflation right. and how the Fed responds. I've had the privilege of talking to Alan Greenspan about this since the idea of, you know, measured the concept of an incremental Fed, which I'm going to editorialize Alan Greenspan invented. How urgent is it for them to do one or two of five or six rate cuts now to assist Wall Street because rates at the Fed are sky high? Well, I don't think their goal is to assist Wall Street. I think their goal is to assist Main Street. And so if they do those cuts, they're going to be to assist Main Street. And I think that it would be beneficial to Main Street if they do them in March. And it is our view Why that- Why not January? Because I don't think the data quite gets them there yet. I don't think it quite gets them there. They need to see a six month annualized rate of 2% on their key metrics, whether that's core PCE, PCE, right? They, they need to see that in order to move and maintain their credibility. The characterization of the balance of risk has clearly shifted in the last 12 months in line with the data. It makes perfect sense. What do you make of one, the recent communication around rate cards and two, how would you expect that to show up in the minutes later this afternoon? Well, look, there, what we're not going to see in the minutes is we're not going to see talk about rate cuts, right? We're going to, that's going to be 
not part of the minutes. They were they were part of the forecast. They are they clearly were as they have said were focused on other things. The minutes are going to show that they were focused on other things. And I actually think that the minutes, while while everybody's going to watch them for little signs of did they did they slip in a a, a, a sort of a little com <laughs> sly communication. What we need to focus on is what's happening with the data. And what we need to understand from the Fed is is it only inflation or are they taking into account a slightly softer um, economy coming off of that blockbuster Q3, slowing down in Q4, and what we anticipate is going to be a little bit slower growth in Q1. Didn't we get a reaction function shift, though, from the Fed? I mean, this is what I'm looking for, that basically, if they see inflation moving down, even if it's well above their target, even if there still are concerns about service, section, uh, service sector inflation, even if housing prices are ticking back up at pretty hefty uh, paces, that they're going to cut rates because they're more concerned about killing uh, the employment market than anything else. Well, let's, let's dissect housing for a minute, because that's a really important factor. So what you see on, on new home sales and what you see on existing home sales, right? That's not what's in the CPI, right? What we have is that owner's equivalent rent and we have rental prices. And market rental prices are falling rather dramatically. And that is going to feed in to the owner's equivalent rent. Secondly, supply is a huge factor in the prices that we're seeing and higher, higher rates limit supply. So you can make an argument, um, and a credible argument, that if you had slightly lower rates, you would actually promote more supply and you'd be less likely to have this price pressure in housing. So the, the reason why I'm struggling with this is because I'm trying to understand what the reaction function then is for the Fed. Are they going to look at potential situations that come down the pike, or are they going to look at the fact that prices are rising, there's still a sticky service sector inflation, they haven't killed the beast yet, and that's the biggest fear that a lot of people have. Yeah, it's a legitimate fear, um, but if we look at the run rate and we look at what we're forecasting by March, you're going to see a six-month annualized rate at 2%. And then the question is, have they hit their target by then? And, and you look at someone like Messer, who, you know, a year, a year and a half ago was saying, we don't have to get to 2% to cut rates. We just need to be making credible progress. And you have a lot of, of Fed presidents that have said something similar, right? And so the question is, what constitutes credibility, right? And, and do we need to see sticky services? Do we need to see services prices falling? Or are we okay with disinflation in goods um, pulling down the whole, whole index? And you're right, we don't know. We don't have absolute clarity on their reaction function. So new year, new voting members. Do you pay much attention to the shifting complexion of the FOMC, the committee? Does it yeah, matter? Yeah, it does, it does matter. I mean, it, it, it absolutely matters in terms of, in terms of absolute votes. Um, and it, it matters in terms of the tone of the conversation in the room. But look, um, for the most part, there's been a fair amount of consensus. And then there's that whole school of thought, you don't want groupthink. You know, do you want every vote to be a consensus vote when it makes sense for some dissent? You, you know, and we, we all say we want diversity of thought, we want diversity of ideas, we don't want groupthink. So some dissension actually, I think, is a healthy sign at the FOMC. Begs the question, where is that official dissent? Why haven't we seen it? Well, look, I think that the, the you know, raise and then hold has not been controversial. I think that's been a very prudent thing to do. I think there, I, I, I think that we haven't seen dissent on that because it, it just, a reasonable person would think that makes a lot of sense as a course of action. I'm waiting for that hand to go up, Tom, in the next few meetings. Someone just to say it might be time to cut interest rates. I think rates. the way the United Kingdom does it is dramatically better. There's all consensus, this fake consensus that the Fed is just blowing. You know, maybe recently they've been more in consensus, I'll give them that. Well, but just this dissent free, we are the world, Forget it. I don't know that this is the we are the world. It's just that to Constance's point, it was more obvious. When inflation was running really hot, they had to kill it. And yeah. they raised rates really rapidly, the rapid, a, rap, mo quickest pace going back to the 1980s. Then they stopped because things were cooling down and you saw inflation coming down. Now is when you would see dissent. Yeah. Now is when you'll start to see people coming out and raising their hand and saying, eh, on the margins, this is what I'm going to emphasize versus that. Next few meetings, maybe. Constance, it was great to see you. Great to see Happy you, New too. Happy New Year. Welcome Thank to the you. program, as always. Constant Hunter there of Macro Policy Perspectives. Those Fed minutes coming out, TK, a little bit later on this afternoon. Will they, won't they discuss interest rate cuts in them? Constance says, no, probably not, Tom. Some, several, a few. McKee actually keeps track of those strange words within the minutes. A few said. Some said. McKee reads them. Several said. Unlike you, so he can, yeah. I can translate honestly say, all of that for us. I, 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 I'm embarrassed to say this. I've never read. You've never read entirety, the minutes? In entirety. In entirety. Okay, that's different. I've never that's read a different. What does that mean? I mean, doesn't everybody skim over sure. certain paragraphs? That's different. That doesn't count. Honest.
Well, that doesn't count. You know, they, they line up who, everyone who's there before like 400 people are in the room at the Eccles building. You know. Last year, tech was it was fabulous in its performance because it had been so brutalized in 2022 when the Bears sold all of tech. The long duration they sold because they were worried about refinancings, but they sold the good stuff that was highly profitable. Look for babies that get thrown out with the bathwater in downdrafts to add to positions that you're building. Uh, and it, in essence, what, what you want to avoid is uh, just the blindly buying dips. You want to be selective. That was John Stolfus of Oppenheimer Asset Management on the tech sector. One stock to watch this morning, Apple. The tech giant falling 3.6% at the close. Its biggest one-day drop since September. The drop following Barclays downgrading Apple to underweight. It was the quote we talked about in the last 24 hours a fair bit. The continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion. Tom, in the opinion of Barclays, that is not sustainable. Let's get right to it. That was clearly the story today. It was just, do you agree it was just one of the reasons why we went down yesterday? Yeah, but, one. You know, it was Not the tangible. reason, but one off. It was tangible. There we are. Let's get right to it. This is so important right now. Dan Ives joins us. He is a bull on any number of technology companies. We wait for him to come out on control data here you know, with a buy recommendation at some point. That's a little bit of history there. Dan Ives with Wedbush. Dan, what's a channel check what exactly is a channel check? I just, I just don't see it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, look, for us, in terms of our Asia supply chain checks, really trying to focus on what demand looks like in terms of the suppliers for iPhones. There have been no cuts from an iPhone perspective as of date. And I think that's, that's bullish. And ultimately, that shows demand through holiday season has actually been on par to actually better right. than expected. And to me, that's what I focus on rather than the haters continue. Okay, but Dana, tell, okay, you've been, you've been gracious about this and they've been gracious about your 2023 ginormous success. But when you do a channel check, are you counting iPhones? Are you over in China guessing the manufacturing line? Are you in the store on Madison Avenue looking at how many people from Lisa's family are buying Apple loot? What's a channel check? Yeah, all of the above, Tom. I mean, we, we feel we're in Apple stores around the country, around the world. We're also talking to suppliers, basically trying to triangulate to what we think units is going to look like for the quarter and for the year. And that's how we've done it from the beginning, I mean, over the last decade. So, and, and it's one, you're always going to have differing opinions. You talk about the Barclays uh, downgrade. We continue to stick with our checks that, that has navigated us, you know, a lot more right than wrong. I think when you look at iPhone 50, it's easy to take shots, you know, relative to, to maybe some of the fears out there, especially fire in a crowd theater, first day of the trading, you know, year. <laughs> I, it's a Groundhog Day. You know, we saw it last year as well. It's underestimated. $250 million is the install base upgrade cycle that's due in that window, has an upgrade in four years. Dan, let's get into it. You mentioned Barclays. Tom mentioned it too. I mentioned it. So let's get to that line. The continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion, not sustainable. In that is a statement of fact. And then there's an opinion at the end. The statement of fact is iPhone sales. They haven't been great for the last 12 months. That's a fact. Yet it's been coupled with multiple expansion. Also a fact. The opinion piece is they're saying it's not sustainable. Are you suggesting that it is? Yeah, so what I'm suggesting is that the next three to four quarters, you're going to have iPhone growth. You have growth coming out of China, despite the fears and obviously a lot of the bear noise. And I think the most important thing is services. I and mean, I think services is going to be teenager type of growth. That's key to the multiple expansion story. And then we go into later this year, there's just going to be more monetization from an AI, as we talked about. That's going to be the next layer. I think it all results... And this is going to be viewed as more of a golden buying opportunity rather than the start to you know, hit the elevator exit. How much, Dan, is your bullish call predicated on this idea of rate cuts, the idea of rates coming down as much as people think? Yeah, look, that's probably 5%, 10% from a multiple perspective. I mean, as we saw, 22, the disaster, 
23 in terms of now popcorn moment, in terms of Fed going to cut in 24. Look, it speaks to our overall bull tech thesis, right? That the soft landing, Pillsbury Doughboy soft landing, you're starting to see now more and more focus on tech. I do think now, you know, as Pharaoh's talked about, multiple expansion in 23, I think the numbers show it in 24. That's the difference. 24 is where the numbers come through in tech. 23 was more the multiple expansion. Well, you mentioned China and how China demand is going to pick back up. But I wonder if it's going to be for iPhones. And I know we've been talking about this for a long time. But yesterday, this caught my attention. The Chinese automaker, BYD, surpassed Tesla in terms of uh, deliveries for the first time. You're seeing that really start to be a main theme. People said that that was never going to happen. People say that it's never going to happen, that Chinese consumers are going to throw out their iPhones. What makes you so confident that we're not going to see the same thing happen in the iPhone cycle that we're seeing right now in the electric vehicle one? Yeah, great question. And, and look, when you focus on Tesla, I mean, that, that's essentially a two-horse race between Tesla and BYD. Tesla actually beat numbers, and China was strong for them. But I think it does speak to, look, domestically, BYD, they're a beast. I mean, they, they've done a phenomenal job, but Tesla's also going to be a winner there in China. When you look at what's happening within the China market from an iPhone perspective, it speaks to just the massive install base that they've built in China. You have 100 million iPhones in China. Right now, a window of an upgrade opportunity. And the irony is, despite geopolitical, the last 18 months, Apple's gained 300 bips of market share. Because the average high-end, I'd say middle-income Chinese consumer, they want an iPhone despite government basically trying to push Huawei. Dan, I'm so pleased that Lisa brought up the EV comparison because I think that industry right now has the potential to be the industry story of 2024. Dan, beyond BYD, beyond Tesla, how much of a reality check are we getting for the industry, for the likes of GM and Ford? I think a big reality check. That's why you've seen Farley, I think Mary, they pulled back you know, in terms of a bit from the EV strategy in Detroit. And, and the problem here is, do, do consumers want EV or they just want a Tesla? And, and I think that that's really the issue that's really starting to play out. And, and at this point, Tesla's doubling down on EVs. But no doubt, there's been, I think, much more moderate demand that we're seeing across the board. And, uh, you know, I think as that plays out, you're going to see others peel back while others go more aggressively like the likes of the Tesla. I wonder what you think the end game actually is. If you speak to the leadership at GM, at Ford, they've been generous with their time. We've had this conversation with them. They talk about a change in execution, maybe not a change in strategy. Would you expect to see a change in strategy this year? And what would that look like? I think slight change in strategy where maybe they, they pull back on some of their long term numbers in terms of EV, when they expect to go fully EV, you know, as it goes 2034, 2035. Look, the UAW also put their back against the wall. It's a different cost structure. And and they're trying right now to, it's a tight balancing act that they're trying to get to in Detroit. And, and I think also it's tough going up against the likes of Tesla and some of these other EVs. That's been a big part of the problem that they're focused on especially now with the UAW increasing the cost structure. Well said, Dan. Good to hear from you. Happy New Year, sir. Dan Thank Ice you, of Wedbush, constructive on the likes of Apple, constructive on the likes of Tesla as well over the last few years. Let's finish on the EVs, Bramo. The distinction, I think the difference between the ambitions of the administration and for that matter, governments around the world to achieve these lofty goals in EVs and reconciling that with the support for unions that we've seen in this country over the last 12 months at automakers at Ford, at GM, whether something's got a give in 2024. And you're seeing a give in Ford and GM ratcheting back their expectations for electric vehicle sales because people just aren't buying them. And it goes to Dan Ives' good questions. Do people want electric vehicles or do they want a Tesla? Are people waiting to see whether yeah. you're going to have some sort of build out of the charging station? I will just add, you are seeing a massive slowdown, though, in car purchases in general. So this is sort where, of Where are we question. on that number? 15 million, 18 million, 12 million? It's really slowed down, right? Yeah, Cox Automotive expects that U.S. auto sales will be up less than 2% this year. And you're okay. seeing that yeah. uh, pretty steadily in the numbers that came out yesterday and that are coming out today and right. tomorrow. Uh, Stephen Trent, Citigroup moments ago reaffirming a buy on United Airlines. How do you do that with the way fares have come down? I don't get it, but he is. He says they've got a trans-Pacific leg up, and he's got a freight. John, I've never seen this phrase before. United Airlines is refleeting. 
Refleeting. I have no idea. Refleeting, I think, is Cathay Pacific was out earlier off of Bloomberg Asia. I guess they're refleeting, too. I think that's by new. These it's stocks, like deplaning. These stocks had a really strong finish to the year. November, yeah. December yeah. for the airlines on the S&P 500. Coming up next on this program, Tracy McMillan of the Wells Fargo Investment Institute. She'll join us shortly. In your equity market on the S&P 500, we're negative here by 0.3% on the S&P. Yields pushing higher once again by four or five basis points, 3.9744. The dollar weaker through 2023, starting 2024 with a bit of strength against the euro. 109.20 on the euro against the dollar. We've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. So I think that gives some room for a broadening out of the market. I'm bullish on equities. I think we're going to have a bullish broadening. You want to be selective, even within what appears to be a nicely broadening rally. I think the prospects for growth here, while not boomy, look reasonably good. I don't think that you can have the kind of growth that we've had, given the kind of economic backdrop that we're looking at. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on day two of trading in 2024, pulling back by 0.3% on the S&P 500. Typically, when you get days like that, TK screams, go to cash. Max Kanner of HSBC doing just that this morning. TK, cut stocks, cut credit, go to cash is the call from HSBC and this morning. And he gets morning. respect. He gets respect. Max was well out front with a bullish call last year. I think we were in London where he was pretty lonely on some optimism for 2023. So I, I do, do know what Max is saying uh, this morning. What I'd say, John, is everybody's back. There's some liquidity back in the market. And I, I just I need to see it settle out. And what is that around? It's around the key economic data we see in two days. And more data coming up later this week, including payrolls on Friday and then earnings <coughs> next week. And the call from Max Kander this morning, Lisa, it's not based on the risk of a sudden deterioration in earnings or activity. It's based on the risk of another repricing in rates. It's exactly the opposite of that, that not only are we not going to see weakness, but people are going to wake up to the strength and realize maybe they've priced in too many rate cuts. He's talking about positioning, sentiment. Maybe people have gotten over their skis. And so now we're going to see reverse Goldilocks from the person who was saying Goldilocks all of last year. It is notable. This is tactical. It is important to note that it's not as if he's saying that the world's going to come to an end. That said, to me, this highlights a sort of sober January that we're in, where people are kind of reassessing the euphoria of nine straight weeks of gains in the S&P 500 and saying, is it really worth continuing? I love that we're branding January two days in, <laughs> two training days in. But to Lisa's You're point, welcome. we've seen some big moves in November, in December. Let's take uh, the bond market, two year, pick out a two year maturity, two year yield November, down 41 basis points, two year yield December, down 43 basis points. Tom, these are some big moves we've seen in stocks and bonds in the last few months. They're big moves from an extended market. And what you do is your technical analysis around support and resistance. I'm looking at the NASDAQ right now. This, folks, easy to do on the Bloomberg terminal. And yeah, we come down, but we are not on support because we had that ginormous November uh, in December. We have to wait and see. Let's remember, corrections are good, right? 10% down is good. That's normal. Who this? That's how you get the fear back in the market. <laughs> You know, when was the last time we had a 10 percent correction? It's, it's it been was, a while. It's been a while. You mentioned tech. Apple, of course, struggled yesterday down yeah. and down hard. One thing that didn't struggle, JP Morgan. JP Morgan closing at an all time high. Earnings from them in two Fridays time. At least for a little bit later this hour, we'll catch up <coughs> with Gerard Cassidy of RBC on that stock and that sector. It seems like anything that's good for uh, bank stocks is just amazing for JP Morgan. Anything that's bad for bank stocks is fine for JP Morgan. They're going to report earnings on January 12th. And to me, the key question is, is what's good for JP Morgan good for banks? Or is what's good for JP Morgan good for JP Morgan because they're consolidating a lot of the banking activity? It's been the latter and not the former, at least for the stock over the last 12 months. The scores this morning, and good morning to you, look like this on the S&P 500, pulling back yesterday, pulling back again this morning by a third of 1%. Yields up yesterday, up again today by four basis points, 397. First trading day of the year, dollar stronger. Day two, Lisa, least a dollar stronger again. The euro, 109.22. Yeah, it's really a continuation of what we <coughs> saw yesterday. Today, Fed speak does resume. I know that everyone is very pleased to hear that. 8.30 a.m., Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin begins his day-long 
uh, discussion with a number of different events, this one with Raleigh Chamber of Commerce. Does he lean into some of the market softness, saying, yeah, people got over their skis when it came to how much they were pricing in our rate cuts? 10 a.m., we get ISM manufacturing, Jolt's job openings, the sort of predecessor, the drumbeat to Friday's jobs report. What I am curious about, We've seen more than a year of sub-50 ISM manufacturing reads. That is contractionary territory. Do we see a continuation of this? And does it matter, considering that the disinflation that we're seeing from goods has not played out in services in the same kind of way? To me, honestly, I keep thinking about that, John. Honestly, this to me has been one of the biggest mysteries because you shouldn't follow the manufacturing numbers if you want to understand where the economy is going. So big question. Do they talk about cuts in the minutes based on what you've just said? We make it an answer at 2 p.m. today. You we do get we the will? FOMC a meeting few. minutes. A few. Many. Some. Many. A couple. <laughs> no, I don't, interest think, rate cuts. I don't think we're going to get an answer. But I do think that we're going to get a reaction from markets that will be interesting to understand where people are positioned right now. Do they press the sell button if there is not mm. explicit pushback or explicit discussion of rate cuts in those meeting minutes? At 2 p.m. Eastern time, that's where the price action might be a little bit later on this afternoon. Why are you laughing at me? Because you won't be awake. <laughs> Tracy McMillian, head of global asset Tracy allocation McMillan strategy will. at Wells Fargo <laughs> Investment Institute, will be awake at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Tracy, wonderful to catch up with you and happy new year. I want to start with a line of yours. Recent data generally feeds the soft landing thesis, we remain skeptical. Tracy, why are you skeptical? Well, we're skeptical mainly because the Fed has signaled three rate cuts in 2024, but the markets have taken that to mean six rate cuts in 2024. So there's got to be a reconciliation that will happen. Markets are saying that inflation just keeps falling and the economy holds up. And we're skeptical of that. We, we think that either inflation falls because the economy continues to weaken or the economy stays strong and the Fed is not able to cut six times. So as we go through that reconciliation process, we think that that's probably going to pressure rates right. a bit higher and it's going to pressure equity markets a, a bit lower. Tracy, your note is absolutely brilliant on the call that earned Earnings will not be the double-digit earnings that a lot of the street is looking at. Down the income statement, where will it be evident that earnings will be short? Is it at revenue? Is it at gross margin? Or is it deeper down? Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be both of those. It's probably going to be on the revenue side because consumers may start to pull back. We had uh, tremendous spending over the holiday season, but we think that that might be the last hurrah for especially the consumers lower down in the inflation quintiles. We're starting to see a lot of stress there. And as they look to expand spending, they, they may be looking to borrowing. Borrowing costs are now much higher. And so that's going to limit spending in those lower quartiles. And our research has shown that the upper quintile cannot make up the difference for the bottom four. So we think consumer starts to weaken here. And so that will pressure revenues. We think margins are also going to be weaker here because of uh, expenses related to uh, continuing wage pressure. So, so we think that that's, that's going to be a, a big part of it as well. I'm struggling to understand the rationale for different people as they get a little more bearish in the rally that we saw for nine straight weeks. It seems like Max Kettner is talking about strength in the economy causing rates to be higher. You're saying that rates are going to be higher, but that we're going to have weakness, the economic weakness that a lot of people were expecting. Is that stagflation? Is that sort of inconsistent, given that a lot of people think that weakness will bring down inflation and will bring down rates further? Yeah, so maybe one thing that's being missed here is that lower rates um, really started to take hold when the Treasury went to a shorter duration issuance. And when they pivot back to longer term paper, that could pressure rates higher, too. So and as rates move higher, we do think that that's going to pressure risk assets. So. We do think that the economy can continue its weakening trajectory, even though rates might start to move a bit higher. Are we going to, what are we going to do with the use of cash? I mean, given the Wells Fargo caution that I see here, the fact is there's going to be free cash flow. What's going to be different this year? Yeah, so what we're going to see in terms of uh, 
uh, investor cash spending and the free cash flow that companies have is that more more money is going to be flowing into cash assets. It's probably going to be flowing into equities as well, <clears throat> but we might wait to see a bit of a pullback in the equity market right. before we start to see that cash flowing. Well, back me, th this goes right to what we were talking about before you came on, Tracy, a bit of a pullback. Aren't corrections good? because they bring up the fear you need for you to go higher? Corrections are good. And I think that one thing that investors often miss is that corrections tend to happen every year. We typically do see a 10% pullback at some point throughout the year. And that does give investors the opportunity to rebalance their portfolios. So if an investor is invested in a diversified portfolio with stocks and bonds, short term uh, fixed income is one place we like right now because that's kind of a holding place. If we get that pullback, we can move assets from fixed income, short-term fixed income, back into risk assets. And we do expect a broadening out uh, of the uh, equity markets by the end of the year. Let's just finish up there, Tracy, this question around whether we're going to see a rotation, that rotation trade out of big tech into the rest of uh, the index. Are you actually bearish on big tech as you expect to see that kind of rotation? So we're not bearish, no. We are neutral right now on, on um, information technology. We were actually favorable for a good part of last year, pulled back on that trade, took some gains, and we've moved it more to cyclical sectors like industrials and materials. We also like healthcare here for the defensive nature of that sector. Tracy, appreciate the update. Thanks for being with us and a happy new year again. Trace McMillan there of Wells Fargo Investment Institute. TK skeptical of the soft landing thesis. The data has been moving in that direction and the market has for sure. A lot of different opinions out there. I mean, everybody's recalibrating. Now, I love what Robin Wig Wigglesworth did over at the FT. I love what Sam Potter did at, uh, at Bloomberg. Just cola, you know, 600 some outlooks. Everybody, do you have an outlook, Jen? A personal the, outlook. The Bramo outlook no, no, was 42 no pages. Outlook. You know, no was, agenda. It was, you know, there's an outlook. I mean, everybody's got an outlook. What's the outlook is, my... I have no clue. I mean, honestly, there's, I don't even have a <clears> sense <throat> of if we get certain economic data, what the market response is going to be. I think that's correct. Will it correct. be good news yeah. for uh, equities? Will it be bad news for equities, given the fact that rates could go up? What Tracy just said there about Treasury issuance, to me, caught my attention because I knew that it would not catch anyone else's attention. Thank but I thought you. that was really interesting. The Treasury <laughs> has been issuing more short-term debt, not long-term debt. If they go back to issuing long-term debt, you could see yields go up even with the go. weakness she's and talking about. Hey, look, I love what you important. said just a moment ago, Lisa, because we said a lot on this program. You need to get two bets right. And sometimes it's really difficult. The bet on the economy and then the bet on the market off the back of it. I would say this also, the bet on interest rates, even those who forecast where the Fed would ultimately end up, they got the call on the economy dead wrong. How many people saw the Fed going to both 5.5% and then the economy delivering GDP growth of something like 5% in the third quarter? Zero, nobody. And this has really been the big surprise from last year. The big surprise for this year is, do we get the long and variable lags or did the lags already happen? And we're just going to move on and we can chug along with this kind of benchmark. And still don't know with any conviction whatsoever. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Of course, the price action this morning, pulling back just a touch, we're negative 0.36%. Yields are a little bit higher by four basis points, 397. It is truly turning 2023 upside down, Lisa, to start 2024. And can it stick? I mean, I understand the lunacy of us trying to come up with a narrative for the entirety of 2024 with two trading days of 2023, not even. Sober January, uh, apparently. Two, two, two trading days in 2024, and all of a sudden we've summed up January and the rest of the year. That said, it does tell you where people were positioned and sort of this feeling of euphoria that people are gut checking right now. I think that that is a sort of telling moment given where the bias had been for the previous nine weeks. Just quickly, a couple of programming notes for you. JP Morgan's Phil Camparelli is going to join us in the next hour. So in about 50 minutes from now, and just confirm this one, Tom, a conversation you do not want to miss. Norman Rule, former senior U.S. intelligence official on the latest out of the Middle East. With our question, our conversation of the day on our fractured international relations, and of course you go to the border between Israel and Lebanon. The prospect of escalation, Tom, is still the question, huge, isn't it? Huge, yeah. And not only, uh, that's really important insight, not only escalation, John, 
but a more multiple depth at the same time escalation. We're not used to that. I mean, that, 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 that's different. That story is just around the corner. Here's the story right now. Equity futures near session lows. We're negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. Treasuries lower yields are higher by four basis points. The dollar a touch stronger. From New York City this morning, good morning. The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. The president has said we are we are ready to act in self-defense if needed. I'm certainly not going to get into specifics of our uh, military operations, but the president is always and has always been committed uh, to our service member and protecting our service member uh, abroad. And that's what the president's going to be committed to. That was White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre speaking on ABC yesterday as the Biden administration looks to defend against Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. The potential for a new battlefront has always been the risk over the last several months. The risk of that taking place, Tom, may be escalating just a touch based on recent news, and we can assess that risk in just a moment. The latest this morning, according to Hamas, a senior Hamas leader killed by Israel in an explosion, Tom, in Beirut. And the distance here is important. It's not all that great a distance from Gaza to Lebanon, but I think within the eastern Mediterranean, John, it shows the multiple fronts here, and all of a sudden there's a whole new immediacy that wasn't there two weeks ago. Trying to take the temperature ago. of this, Tom, in the commodity market is really difficult. October, crude lower. November, December, crude lower. This yeah. morning, WTI doing nothing, $70.30. Brent crude positive by just 0.1% to $75.00. 99 cents. Let's get to it, and we do it with an authority that we have had through the torment of the Eastern Mediterranean. Norman Rule joins us now, senior advisor of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and of course, his work for the nation uh, in intelligence. Norman, when I say Lebanon, for all of us of a certain persuasion, we are completely formed by something, frankly, a stunning 40 years ago which is the Beirut barracks bombing when we lost Marines at accountable Iwo Jima level. Where are we now with Lebanon, with Hezbollah? Do we have a relationship or was it forever fractured 40 years ago? That's an excellent uh, point and I regret I remember that incident well um, and lost friends. Uh, the uh, event of 40 years ago actually had a different message for the world. The U.S. pulled out of Lebanon at that time. And Osama bin Laden later stated that watching the withdrawal of the United States from Lebanon was one of the motivators for him to undertake his operations because he realized the West could be pushed back out of the region. Are we being pushed back now? I mean, within the multiple fronts that Lisa Abramowitz has outlined this morning, Gaza, the West Bank, and again, up to the border with Lebanon, is the West, is America being pushed out now? No, we have a very different profile, and indeed diplomacy is likely going to, in, to increase in intensity in coming weeks because we need to come up with a way to move Lebanese Hezbollah north of the Israeli border so that Israeli citizens can return to their homes, the thousands, tens of thousands of Israeli citizens to open their businesses, go to school, and also so that tens of thousands of Lebanese can return south to that border, which has become such a flashpoint in recent weeks. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of people have been uh, misplaced or displaced placed as a result of some of the fighting on both sides. But Norman, I'm curious whether this is an escalation. The fact that Israel uh, did attack, according to Hamas, but also with a wink, wink, nod, nod from Israeli officials uh, to kill this Hamas uh, executive. 
Well, to be clear, Israel has stated from the beginning of the October 7th massacre that it would eradicate the Hamas leadership responsible for that action. And therefore, this is no surprise. I think what you have to look at is this drone attack, which Israel has not admitted, but is understood to have under undertaken, took place in an incredibly security conscious neighborhood. And it demonstrates an exquisite and dynamic intelligence capacity. So as Hezbollah thinks about its counter, its, uh, its response to this, it's got to think about about what is known around us and what can we get away with and what will happen to the people who might be involved in that attack against Israel. Do you have any sense, Norman, of what the conversations are like with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with the Iranian leadership, given the fact that a lot of people think that they're taking some cues from Iran, that there has been funding from Iran, that you have the Iranian warship going to the Red Sea, and the Houthis, also Iranian-backed, uh, making noise and trying to interrupt Western shipping lines? Iran and its proxies have no strategic drivers to involve themselves more fully in this conflict. It would impact multiple strategic equities for a gain that is uncertain. But they have multiple incentives to continue and perhaps raise the intensity of attacks against Israel to show that they have skin in the resistance game. I should also note that today, the January 3rd, is the fourth anniversary of the killing of, of Qasem Soleimani. And that's a day when one would expect uh, 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 Iranian proxies to attack U.S. or Israeli uh, uh, forces just for that symbolic of our anniversary. Exactly where I wanted to go. Norman, let's talk about it. The assassination of the Major General. It's easy to forget that it ever happened because several weeks later, many weeks later, we were all drowning in a global pandemic. What has happened since then with the relationship between the United States and Iran, between two different White Houses? Very little. The uh, in indirect engagement that took place uh, did produce the possibility of uh, uh, of some sort of uh, engagement, a, a hostage uh, uh, release by the Iranians in exchange for the release of personnel. But Iran's regional activities did not change. And I don't think the White House expected them to change. More so, Iran's nuclear program has continued to expand. And here's the important point. Iran is now producing en enriched uranium at a level that no state that has not pursued a nuclear weapon has ever produced. It has no civilian use for the nature of its current enrichment. So you have to ask yourself the question, Question. Has the West de facto recognized an Iranian military nuclear program? The White House would say no. Right. But the facts do raise the question. Norman, a tough way to segue here, but I'm going to do it as one final question. Taiwan continues to come up within our first of the year conversations. Do we have good intelligence on mainland China? The United States intelligence program against China has stated by Sec uh, Central Intelligence Agency head Bill Burns is robust and works significantly. I won't comment on those operations to the extent that I know of them, but I will say that it, this remains such a priority that it's an all-source intelligence program, so it's all imagery and a variety of different aspects. We're going to have a good understanding of some of China's activities that will provide the warning policymakers need. Norman, thank you, sir, for the update. Your insight, Brilliant. so valuable. Norman Rule there for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you, sir, and a Happy New Year. Cut off for Happy New Year. Official. January 5th. Official. Come it's official. on. According to it's who? Official. The fair rules of yes. existence? It's just they've been established <laughs> yeah, for a right long, now. long time. Mm, something like that. Page 24, Pharaoh's Manor's book. <laughs> just because of that, I'm going to say Happy New Year till February yeah. 29th. And there is February a February 29th. 29th. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yeah. One of those years. Yeah. There's a 29th okay. this year, huh? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. News Rabbi. you need to know. That's news you can use. <laughs> Thank you for that. Can the cutoff is the 5th. All right. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard March cut No more of that. I can't believe it's been four years, Tom, since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. I just yeah, remember um, sitting there that evening yeah. in New York City watching this play out on, on the news, on cable news here in America, facing the real prospect of maybe some kind of military escalation between two nations. That was basically the big story to start the year. And then all of a sudden we're drowning well, in the pandemic and it's not talked about through much of 2020. And, and to my book of the year, The Loom of Time, when Robert Kaplan, he really emphasizes this, John, we underplay Iran. I'm guilty of this like everyone else. I'll just point out that Iranian state TV is reporting that there were some explosions near the grave of the Iranian commander Soleimani today uh, in this anniversary day. We don't know more details about it, but still that tension very much forefront of people's minds. And it raises this question to Norman Rule. The fact that the U.S. hasn't gone more aggressively against Iran raises this question of whether they're tacitly accepting <clears throat> the nuclear program they've been continuing 
or is it basically just there's this ginger dance to try to avoid some massive conflagration that nobody wants? Well, that's the the ginger dance is what we've been doing. What's the I ginger mean, dance? You, you know, <laughs> want to get up and do it? <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> I'm gonna that's just what stop. that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just okay. move on. Right. Like, come on, it's, a real it's education early. this morning. Thank you. <laughs> can I can I point it. out something off of what you Grandma know where said? I was at? <laughs> do you know that here at Bloomberg, February 29th is a work day? News I mean, you also need to know. There's, there's, Are you suggesting uh, it should be a national holiday? I think, I think there's, yeah, sure, it should be. I mean, they're squeezing another day out of us. I mean, that's. I think the election should be a national holiday. I really do believe that. I don't, I, I, I still don't understand. Any other holidays? Yes, I don't I understand why it's well, not. They, so many nations do it on Sunday, but yeah, you're right. If you're going to do it on it's, Tuesday. It should be. Give every, yeah. It's an easy one. Yeah, it's an easy one. Nothing you okay. should be able to do is also say Happy New Year for an extended period of time. I mean, look, it's a free world. I'm just saying if I had just preferred speech, I'm saying if I had preferred speech on campus, <laughs> on my campus. preferred speech would be that would be that. end January 5th, all okay, right? Safe okay, safe space. Get back to school. <laughs> Following nine weeks of gains on the S&P 500, the equity market meets gravity. Yesterday on the S&P, lower this morning, lower by 0.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down by 0.6. The Russell of small caps down almost a full percentage point. On the Nasdaq yesterday, the worst day since October. Sounds dreadful. Lisa, following a 54% rally through 2023. <laughs> meeting gravity. I love that. I just imagine someone on the monkey bars like myself and meeting gravity. There's a question, though, here. Uh, when we look forward, can you create a narrative from this? Is this sort of the rotation that people were looking for? Or is this something more dramatic where people perhaps got a little ahead of themselves at the end of last year. Hard to really make a narrative, but it gives you a sense of just how crowded some of the positioning was, particularly in tech. Well, big winners towards the end of last year. Discretionary tech, to your point, were the big losers yesterday. Big winners in yesterday's session, healthcare utilities. Banks stood out to me. Yields up, banks did okay. Thank you, JP Morgan, once again. And it also was Citigroup with Mike Mayo coming out and talking about a tripling in the stocks. At what point are we talking about what's good for JP Morgan is good for JP Morgan? We mentioned this earlier versus what's good for all the banks. There is a feeling that something has to give. Private equity companies are going to have uh, some exits on their funds. They're going to have IPOs. You've got companies that have to refinance debt. Banks are going to cash in on all of that at a time when you do see enough stability for them to maybe get some of that action. Bank earnings. Earnings from JP Morgan two Fridays away. So next week, that's a story for us. Elsewhere in the bond market, Lisa yields up yesterday, yields up again today of five basis points, having a little look at 4% on a 10 year, 398 with Fed minutes coming up a little bit later. Do they or don't they discuss the potential for rate cuts next year? this year, I guess. I'm going to have to remind myself that we're already in 2024 about 15 times. Happy New Year. Just want to mention Happy that. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yeah, also, we should that. we point out, while we were away on our different sojourns, it's January 3rd, it's okay. Not only boots. Happy New Year, but birthday greetings to Jonathan Farrow. Is Thank you, TJ. Slipped yeah. in there. Mm. So what is it like to have a birthday on New Year's so Eve. near New Year's Eve. What was it's it on like? New Year's Eve, Tom. Was it traumatic? <laughs> I, Did you I think they were this throwing? Sort of like heartfelt, emotional birthday wish yeah. in December. That's what you got from me. Yeah, you know. Bramo texted me. Everyone messaged me, apart from. I, I just it wasn't. From, I wasn't aware. My people birthday. didn't tell me it was your birthday. But the, what was it like as a kid? Did you think they were having a party for you? I at took midnight? it personally when they celebrated when my birthday finished. Yeah. Which is what often happens, right? It's fireworks and yay and champagne corks flying. And now which I go is, to bed really early, this is which is very reason, on brand. This is the reason why you have an issue with Happy New Year. Let's discuss more. Well, we can. It's sure. it's it's like Dr. Lisa. <laughs> childhood drama. <laughs> childhood by. drama. Tortured. Okay. That's our first under surveillance today. Right? <laughs> Let's get to foreign exchange. <laughs> Thank you for the birthday wishes. Let's get to FX and finish on the Euro. 109.27. We talked a lot about how 2024 so far, early days, of course, is 2023 upset side down and at least the dollar's no different. Yeah, well, what we saw yesterday was the biggest rally of the dollar, dollar stronger versus the euro since March. I mean, just the sense of how much we were set up for this, because everyone was talking about the weakness in, in the euro region, that they still wouldn't cut rates as soon as the Federal Reserve. Somehow people bought into that over the last couple of weeks. It's kind of odd. If there's going to be a central bank that cuts rates, Tom, based on deterioration in economic activity, 
Isn't the yeah. ECB seeing it already? Yeah, Never ECB's mind the Fed and the U.S. economy. Within ECB's the ballet that we do, ECB's got to be way out front on this. And to sum off that, I would look at Swiss franc as sort of a triangulation of what's going on. Which has been super, super strong. Yeah, super, super strong. That's the FX market, the dollar, a touch stronger this morning. Under surveillance today, <clears throat> a senior Hamas leader killed in an explosion in Lebanon's capital of Beirut. The Palestinian militant group saying Israel was behind the strike, raising fresh concerns of a wider conflict in the Red Sea. Mass stopping its ships once again from sailing through the area. Lisa, the Holt coming after another of its carriers came under attack in the span of just a few weeks. And if you're curious how the market's responding and you take a look at crude, it's down, it's not. So at this point, even as we worry about escalation and we take a look at the potential ramifications, markets are not waking up to them. And I keep pointing to this in my head and saying, does this mean that the risk is off the table or does this mean that markets have gotten used to ignoring any kind of geopolitics? The warm embrace of 13.3 million barrels a day of oil production in America no doubt is shaping this to, to some extent. Shaping this market a little bit later, tons of data. We need to talk about the ISM manufacturing and jolts. That's going to come at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So a few hours from now. Later on this afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern time, Fed minutes from the December meeting, a meeting in which Chairman Powell said in the news conference that officials discussed rate cuts. Since then, <coughs> we've had a range of officials saying different things about that little dovish tilt. Anna Wong of Bloomberg Economics expecting the minutes to strike a delicate balance, delicate balance. Lisa, between the two camps. Or a ginger dance, if you wish. I honestly am curious, though, about how the market responds to this, because ultimately it's going to be the data, and we can dance around this all we want, but it's not really going to drive things three days from now. That's my sense. Tom, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Big deal. No, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's going to be a lot of species. I mean, They're massively exposed, and I'm going to go to where wage growth is in ECI. The ECI wages and benefits index is nowhere near where they have permission to cut rates. Nowhere near. Let's go local. Let's talk about house prices. Manhattan home prices rising for the first time in more than a year. Purchases in the fourth quarter at 5.1% from a year earlier, the first annual increase since the third quarter of 2022. Now, you might be thinking this is about interest rates, going to the bank, borrowing lots of money at 6% or whatever. No, more than two thirds of Manhattan buyers paid cash, the highest share since Miller Samuel started tracking in 2014. Two thirds <laughs> paying cash. And the median, price of these purchases, $1.16 million. There this isn't go. exactly people who are on the lower income sphere who are saying, yes, interest rates have fallen all the way back yeah, down to 6.5%. It's a good message in that we can aggregate things, and particularly we, I aggregate things around three zip codes, and the answer is there's a, a lot of nuances nationally to what we see, which is supposed to be rent disinflation, and we'll have to see on that. Right now we're going to get to it, and this is without question our uh, yield, our rate, maybe folded into the Fed discussion of the day. Gennady Goldberg joins us, head of U.S. rate strategy at TD Securities. I'm going to cut to the chase. You say at some point we're going to get to a lower rate regime, 3 percent. How far behind is the Federal Open Market Committee? I know they got to wait for wage inflation to come in on that, but how far behind is Jerome Powell right now? I mean, that's the big question. You know, it, it's interesting. They've sent a very dovish signal. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, I mean, there's been a lot of pushback on, you know, that dovishness from other Fed officials. They don't know. What scared them, I think, is inflation actually coming down a lot faster than they initially anticipated. I mean, they were looking at inflation basically coming, you know, 50 basis points lower between their Q3 and Q4 summary of economic projections. That's a heck of a miss. You know, you were talking 50 basis points just in one quarter. That makes real rates a lot higher in real terms right now than they initially expected. That's tightening financial conditions pretty significantly. I feel like some Fed officials have been trolling us, making out that <laughs> we didn't hear what we did hear in the news conference. So I always pull up the quote from Chairman Powell just to remind myself that I actually did hear it. When he said the question of when it will become appropriate to begin dialing back the amount of policy restraint in place is clearly a topic of discussion now in the world and also a discussion for us at our meeting today. Would you expect to see something like that in the minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern time? I think there's going to be a lot for everybody. Um, you know, I, I, do, I think there's going to be some hawkishness, some dovishness. I think you're going to see the discussion come through. What you're not going to see come through is an exact you know, commitment to cutting rates in March. And what's interesting to me is that the market right now is almost perfectly priced in for a March cut. That's not what you're going to see in the minutes. The minutes are going to be all sorts of discussion about what it would take, what it would get the Fed comfortable. Uh, you know, as we we're talking about wages earlier, wages aren't quite there, but inflation is coming lower. So, yes, the data is important, 
But the inflation data next week, I would say, is probably even more important than the Fed minutes, than payrolls, anything this week. To that point, the reaction function seems to have changed the Fed. And that, to me, was even bigger than what Fed Chair Powell was saying with the potential discussion around Fed rate cuts. It seems like the Fed is more amenable to the idea of cutting rates just simply in response to inflation going lower than anything else, and especially in protection of the labor market. Do you see that as being reflected, that suddenly it really is not about a long-term kind of feeling that they need to kill off once and for all this inflation beast? I think they're getting more comfortable with inflation actually being a little bit more under control. They're very reluctant to break out that mission accomplished banner just yet. They know how that goes historically. But they're getting a little bit more comfortable. And now what they're saying is, we've got the data basically in a good spot. You know, labor markets are still chugging along. Growth is still chugging along. We can start bringing down rates earlier. We don't want to over tighten. I think that's the message they're sending. That's why they've tipped their hand, that they are net dovish but the markets are probably overreacting a little bit. Well, are they though? I mean, if you take a look, for example, at housing prices, rents are coming down, and that's what we see in some of the inputs to CPI. But as we were just talking about, home prices are climbing. That's gonna feed in later. There are these other kind of areas that are inflationary pressures that are gonna come down the pike that aren't gonna be reflected in the data that we get over the next couple of months. How much is the Fed gonna really miss the boat here in terms of being able to kill off inflation? And we're gonna see that later this year. Well, what's interesting is even if you take, you know, our, let's say more aggressive profile into account. So we've got 200 base points of rate cuts penciled in for this year, another 50 for next year. So going back to 3% on the funds rate, Even if you take that into account with our inflation projections, the real Fed funds rate, ex ante, is still going to be about 6.5 to 6.75. Uh, Excuse me, 1.5 to 175 percent. A little too high there. Um, But, you know, (laughs) we are looking for still a real Fed funds rate that is notably positive to anything we've seen over the last 15 years. It's still going to be tightening, just not quite at the pace the Fed was tightening at. We're at at about 3.5% right Right. now and declining. Let me get an honest question from you because Toronto Dominion has great Toronto Maple Leaf seats and maybe (laughs) you can talk on this where a lot of our guests can't talk on this. They're constrained. To your good point about elevated real rates and the tension in private equity and private credit now, I just did a three-month LIBOR to go back, folks, to 1985. Almost 40-year regression of the great disinflation is seen in three-month LIBOR, that benchmark, the keel of the sailboat, if you will. Right now, we are out three standard deviations, higher yields. It's anomalous in every sense of the way back 40 years. What is the urgency now of the Fed to normalize rates to assist a financial system that may be breaking? Well, I think they're worried about over tight. And that's what they're telling you. That's what Powell kind of came out and basically tipped his hand to. The rest of the FOMC, I don't know how much on board they are with, you know, really delivering that soft of a landing. And that's the big tension here, is how aggressively does the Fed pursue the soft landing? How comfortable are they that they've actually declared mission accomplished on inflation? And how comfortable are they that that, you know, that easing is going to actually feed through into the data fast enough to deliver that soft landing? Because markets are perfectly priced right now for soft landing. Did you get the feeling that that was Chairman Powell on an aircraft carrier with the banner behind him saying, mission accomplished? While also somehow, uh, you know, ignoring that and, and making belief that that banner wasn't actually behind right? him. That's kind of right. what it felt like. Right. And, and that's what you got from the other Fed speakers, including John Williams, you know, who came out basically, you know, a couple of days later and said, no, 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 there was no banner there. Right. There wasn't a mission accomplished banner. So they're trying to have it both ways, which is why I think late in the cycle, you want to be very careful about, you know, listening to the Fed. Think about what they have to do. Right. They're telling you they want to deliver that very soft landing, which means they do want to be a little bit more aggressive on cuts, not aggressive enough to actually start them tomorrow or the day after. But if inflation keeps coming down, and that's what they were telling you, if inflation keeps falling, they will deliver those cuts probably starting relatively soon. Hasn't the market already cut rates for them? Effectively. So they've sort of overeased financial conditions. And I think that's the big risk right now is that have they actually thrown another round of of financial conditions easing into the mix where they don't need to deliver the cuts. They don't need to go in March as the market's pricing in. They can go in May or June and very easily keep financial conditions accommodative. We've got payrolls on Friday, and I'm looking at some of the estimates. 190 from Goldman Sachs. City just published 190 over a city. What are you and the team looking for on Friday? 
We're looking at 180, uh, so right about there. There's a lot of uncertainty around December payrolls, just keep that in mind, lots of seasonal factors. The important thing is the employment rate at 3.8%. You know, if that stays steady, that tells us we're not really deteriorating that sharply. If we continue to drift higher as we have, you know, we've gone from a low of 3.4 to 3.8, it's been a very silent drift higher. If that continues, that tells us there's more labor market slack. A lot of it's from the supply side, but we'll see what happens on the demand side as well. We haven't seen the layoffs yet. Gennady Goldberg, Gennady, thank you, sir. <laughs> appreciate it, appreciate it. Looking ahead to payrolls Friday. The estimate, the consensus estimate, the median in our survey, which is often a moving target because we get new estimates as the week progresses, that's about 170. 190 ton, the estimate City, oh. 190 at Goldman. We just heard from Gennady that they're looking for about 180. Yeah, nowhere near what David Kelly at JP Morgan's modeling out, which is negative non-farm payrolls out there somewhere, and it's out there. Where, where are we out to? 2025 on that? I don't yeah, know. no idea. I'm still getting used to 24. JP Morgan, record high. Up next, Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets from New York. This is Bloomberg. I think the bottom line is that Citigroup is becoming a much more simple and profitable firm whose earnings should double over the next three years. But this is make or break time for Jane Frazier. You said, mm -hmm. is this due to Jane Frazier? Mm -hmm. Maybe, mm -hmm. I think so, Yeah. but not definitely. That was Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo naming Citi his top pick for 2024, saying he expects shares to more than double over the next three years. This is JP Morgan. It's a fresh record high for the first time in more than two years. Gerard Cassidy, large cap bank analyst at RBC Capital Markets, writing this. After a tumultuous 2023, we believe the banks are well positioned for investors to earn outsized returns in 2024, and investors should overweight the sector in their portfolios. Gerard Cassidy, I'm <coughs> pleased to say, joins us now. Gerard, let's go straight to it. Number one question. This is a question for me, and I know it's a question for Lisa. Is this off the back of higher yields? or lower yields? I would say, John, that uh, we're expecting that the yields gravitate lower, especially at the front end of the curve. When you take a look at what the Fed has done, if we truly are at the terminal rate for Fed funds in the past four tightening cycles, when they started to cut rates, it's always been a catalyst for bank stocks. And I think what we're expecting as the market is that at some point in 24, the Fed could cut short-term interest rates. Is this for bank stocks or is this for J.P. Morgan? Lisa, very good question <laughs> because J.P. Morgan has been the risk off trade and it's been spectacular, as you guys mentioned, record highs. And so if we're going into a risk on environment, which I believe we are, if the Fed is finished tightening, then actually J.P. Morgan is probably going to be a source of funds for many investors. It is a stock that is owned everywhere. It's been a great stock. But risk on may be the better way to go with a Bank of America or Citigroup or others like that. A source of funds. I love that. It's a euphemism for it gets sold so that you can raise money to buy something you think is going to return more. The fact that you think it's going to be Bank of America. Do you also lean into the Mike Mayo idea that Citigroup and its whole revamp with some of its uh, streamlining, <clears throat> cutting units, massive job cuts is going to be the real winner? Over time, it's going to be certainly an opportunity to be a winner. Uh, they've still got a lot of heavy lifting. Jane Frazier's leading the charge here, of course. And I think it's a very uh, big, complicated job. It's turning around an ocean liner. There's early progress, a lot of heavy lifting, as I said, to do. But if she can succeed and the management succeed, this stock is definitely undervalued and it has great upside. But it's been a value trap for many years, so we'll have to wait and see. Gerard, I went to a seminar once at a firm long ago called Tucker Anthony and RL Day, and I was lectured that banks are supposed to return nominal GDP plus a little bit. I'm going to center tendency is that make an 8, 9, 10% once in your lifetime. JP Morgan has turned that upside down. You didn't see this coming. You're the expert, nor did anybody else. The returns of 10 years, of 20 years, or 15% or so, their 30-year return is solid double-digit return. What did Harrison, what did Diamond get right? Tom, it's really Jamie Diamond, I think. Or you could get, give Harrison credit, I guess, for merging with Bank One when Jamie Diamond was their CEO. And of course, Diamond has taken over since then. And it's been his steadfast focus 
on delivering for shareholders, both through expansion and growth, but at the same time controlling expenses. They also have done a very good job in diversifying their revenue. Their consumer banking business, similar to Bank America, is very, very profitable. On top of that, they've got a, a very strong capital markets business, the Bear Stearns acquisition, which was very difficult in early years because of the reputational problems that came along with it, has worked right. out extremely well for them. So I would say the diversity of revenue, Tom, and the focus on leading or uh, delivering for shareholders. But back to Andrew Jackson, who you covered you know, years ago, Gerard. I mean, are they the fifth bank of the United States? Over the holidays, somebody said one out of five profit dollars comes to J.P. Morgan. They're building their palace on Fifth on Park Avenue right now. I mean, to the Butch Cassidy idea, who are these guys? Are they the bank of the United States? I, I don't think they're the bank of the United States, but they have done a great job in delivering for their shareholders and, and for their employees and their communities as well. It's been a big growth engine for the company, this economy, the global economy as well. And again, it's this leadership that they have under Diamond and his executive management team. And Tom, you know, many of his senior folks have left J.P. Morgan or are now CEOs of other uh, banks like Charlie Sharp at Wells Fargo. And so he's got a very deep bench and they execute. That's, and that's the key, Tom. You know, banking is a commodity business, as you well know. It's all about execution. And J.P. Morgan is ex executed extremely well. What is the business model, though, that you want to execute as a big U.S. bank, Gerard? And this, I think, is one of the key questions that we had during last year when the rise of private capital, uh, private equity, private debt really was challenging the capital markets activity of certain big financial institutions. Can the J.P. Morgans, the Bank of America, the Citigroups get into the private debt world that in some ways has been stealing their lunch? I think it can, Lisa. And, and when you think about it, and, and you're right, the private equity, private debt area is certainly growing uh, much faster than the banks. But believe it or not, the shadow banking industry has been taking the bank's market share for 40 years. You go back to the early 80s and you look at the market share that the banks had of lending into the United States. It was well over 40 percent. The private or shadow banking market was in the low 20s. Today, it's completely flip flopped. The bank's market share now is in the low 20s and the shadow banking is in the 50, over 50 percent. So the banks have done it through consolidation. You know, when Tom and I were young, we had over 18,000 banks in the United States in the early 1980s. Today, there's 4,600. J.P. Morgan has been a big beneficiary of that, and they've been able to create those efficiencies. So, yes, they can compete. They will compete. And I don't think that the banks are going to be put out of business, but certainly they don't have the market share that they used to have. But we have to remember, too, the economy has grown dramatically in 40 years, and they have a smaller <coughs> slice of the pie, but they're more profitable than ever. Not what just J.P. Morgan, but other banks as well. What about the smaller banks, given the fact that they uh, you're talking about a bigger slice of uh, just overall activity? Mm -hmm. You haven't seen that so much in the smaller banks. And with rates remaining high, you're going to have real commercial real estate pressures as well. It's interesting. It depends on uh, you know how small the bank is and who owns it. I've always maintained this banking system we have in the United States is obviously very polarized. You've got the very small banks at one end and the very large banks at the other end. And if it's a non, if it's if the owners of the smaller banks, private banks or mutual savings banks or another group of banks, if their owners are comfortable with earning returns on equities of four or five percent and they're not going to sell the bank as long as they have FDIC insurance, they're going to remain in business indefinitely. On the other end, if you do have a bank with 30 billion in assets and it's not earning up to what its shareholders want it to earn, then they're going to have to consolidate. So consolidation is going to continue. We're in a pause right now, but the long term trend has been consolidation and the industry will continue to consolidate in the future, in our view. Jared, let's finish on Washington, if we can. I was speaking to your colleague, Amy with Silverman, just yesterday, and we were reflecting on a line that came from Laurie Cavasina, who I think described presidential politics and the election on the horizon like staring at the sun. I just wonder if that's what it's like for you. Have you given any thought to changes in leadership in Washington and what it might mean for the companies that fall under your coverage? John, it's a good question because it's going to be the topic du jour this year, of course, with the election coming. And what we can say is that under the current administration, there's been more regulation of banks, particularly with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. 
We don't know who's going to be running, you know, just yet in November. But if Trump is the candidate for the other party, the Republican Party, and if he was to win, his administration had less regulation for banks. So if that administration was to come back, you would have to expect they would change the heads of different regulatory agencies in 2025. And there probably would be less regulation for the banks as we move forward. You know, John, I I think Bloomberg Radio is missing it today because we're seeing the fireplace with Gerard (laughs) Cassidy here on Bloomberg Television. The warmth of Cassidy. Can you talk about inflation? South Paris, Maine, $325 per cord of red oak. That's delivered to Shea Cassidy. And he's he's (laughs) popping like eight, nine cords a winter. He's a think about that. I mean, it's adding up. It's expensive. But don't you love the smell? The smell's great. The damn dog is over by the fireplace. The smell. You know, his, his dog's called Elizabeth. We won't go there. And, uh, we won't go know. there. Jared, thank you. <laughs> Joe Cassidy of RPC Capital Markets. Thank you, sir. Coming up a little bit later on Bloomberg TV and radio, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. A few hours from now, Morgan Stanley, Executive Chairman James Gorman, as he leaves his post as CEO, an exclusive conversation with Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. Lisa, that is the exit interview with Shanali a little bit later. Yeah, with Tim uh, Pick coming up and taking over. Ted Pick, excuse me taking the helm of the big ship that frankly has beaten Goldman Sachs for so many years. Can they continue to do that in 2024? Looking forward to the conversation. Looking forward to this as well. Up next on the program, Phil Camparelli of JP Morgan Asset Management. From New York, equity futures session loads. We're down 0.4%. I do think the Fed is probably going to be disappointing here relative to the speed at which rate cuts are priced into the market. I don't think the Fed is going to deliver what the market is expecting. You start to see data that is a little bit more inflationary. That narrative on how much the Fed's going to cut has to change. The Fed has been remarkably sensitive in practicing its mandate. We think it wants to keep it that way. You've got the Fed wind at your back in 2024. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Day two of a new year, a struggle in the equity markets, the world turned upside down. And thank God at 10 a.m. this morning, we got the John Farrell statistics. You think ISM matters. ISM services matters. Manufacturing less so. ISM manufacturing has been sub 50 since late 2022. If you were following that to make some kind of trading call on the broader economy, the broader market, you'd just be dead wrong. Outside of ISM manufacturing, Tom, it's pretty decent if you focus on jobless claims. And this week is all about the jobs report. Payrolls on Friday, the estimate at the moment about 170, some 190s out there from City, from Goldman. Right. That's pretty decent. After the big interest rate hikes we've had so far, this wasn't what we expected to start 2024 I'm going to look with. at the headline data, wage inflation. Wage inflation just has said, do not pass go to the Fed so far. They can't move until wage inflation comes down. They're teasing it, though, aren't they? Yeah. The chairman Powell flirted with the idea that maybe they're starting to discuss it, which tees up the Fed minutes, Tom, later this afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern time. An underpinning here, and Lisa, this is your wheelhouse. It's the idea that the bond market turned upside down, the credit market, private equity, private credit. Our Canadian shop today talking about uh, certain transactions up in Canada. What is the stress in the credit market right now? Non-existent. That's where it is. I mean, basically what you've seen is everybody flooding into credit riskier and riskier as the year went on. The question is whether that's warranted. A lot of people saying it is because basically we've been able to handle these rates. And if they're going down, well, fantastic. Kumbaya. Let's refinance and get on our our way. I mentioned this Anton Gar's effort in the FT today. There's a wall of cash in private equity looking for a warm spot, more private credit. But at the same time, they have a wall of cash invested that they're trying to get out of, and that stopped this year, right? Yeah, if you take a step back, right, so there is sort of two and a half trillion on one side of cash and private equity and $2.9 trillion of exits that they need to do for the companies they're actually invested in. If you take a zoom out kind of approach, there has been stasis in a lot of capital markets over the past year because of how high rates are. When things start to defrost, which direction will they go? Will you start to see valuations truly reset given the fact that we haven't really seen the visibility? Or will we start to see, you know, all things to the moon, everything's a go, and inflation continue to reignite? You and I talk about this, and she just goes, well, we need to see exits. What in God's name is an exit, John? Exit from what? IPO market? I don't know. Potentially some business for the banks, TK. 
I, going I, public. Yeah, well, it's a part of global Wall Street. It's been really, really soggy here. And with the turmoil that we see in the equity markets, futures negative uh, 21. John, the VIX still hasn't come back. 13.86 on the, on the VIX is still not like a two-day Wish move. we had the Bramo cam up for when you weigh in. It's like this deep breath. It's like yoga trading, like relaxation. Please, like stop. Deep, no, deep no, breath, Just no. to kind of like reset. Stay cool. Stay calm. Well, no, I just, you know, I, I, I'm glad that you defined exits. Sorry to use drugs. Exit. I think no. everyone. I think that I could take an Anyway, exit. we're going to exit. Price action <laughs> looks exit. like this. Let's get a screen up on the S&P 500. <laughs> Equities down by 0.4% on the S&P. Keep going back to this call from Max Kantner of HSBC. Yes. Look, he was bullish all of last year. And you're right, Tom. I remember sitting down with him early on in the year and he was talking about the biggest risk being the upside risk in markets. And he was right to call that out. It was long equities, was long credit. When everyone was talking about being maybe overweight cash, receiving 5%. <clears throat> this is what he's saying this morning. The biggest risk right now. And it's not a deterioration in earnings activity. What he's looking for is another repricing in rates. And if you get the kind of numbers that Goldman Sachs and City are looking for, in a payrolls report on Friday, you keep seeing that through the year and it keeps pushing off the idea that the right. Fed cuts anytime soon. Maybe you do get the max count. And I'm going to go into short term rates as well, maybe away from what the economists are talking about. Their 10 year real yield, 1.75%. And Gennady was just signed with TD Securities saying that has to come down. I don't see the oomph there to get it down to 1.5 or 1.2%. I took you this morning, Tom, 435, 10 year <clears throat> at about 398, pushing 4% this morning well, on a 10 year trend. What we're doing here, folks, equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, I believe that's multi-asset. Phil Camparelli joins us right now with J.P. Morgan Asset Management, multi-asset portfolio. Which asset is the best to be in right now? Equities. And it's, and it's pretty simple. So we have a Fed who did their last hike in July, and we have an economy that we think only has a 20% probability of going into recession in 2024. If you put those two things together... We have a 7% overweight to equities right now. And that's the biggest overweight that we've had in equities since before this crazy tightening cycle began in March of 2022. And there's a good reason why. I talked about the no recession right. view. But we can now play defense with bonds. And I can exhale saying that because we really do believe that, if the, that the risk has shifted from inflation being the risk and rates being a risk to if we're wrong on the equity side, it's probably because growth is slipping and we get the protection in bonds. So okay. we're trying to make diversification great again here. Today. I just brought up the Bloomberg Total Return Index, which is a really, really good, elegant chart. And it's right up against resistance here. We've had, as you say, mm -hmm. bonds and historic disappointment yes. in bonds. Yep. Is it all clear now? for total return on bonds? Um, we think it is because I think there's a big difference. We've to, you guys have been talking a lot, and we've been talking a lot, too, about, well, maybe they don't ease this much. Like, maybe they don't do this March easing. I think that's fine. But we just think it's a very low probability, Tom, that they're going to hike again. So that's a regime shift. Because last year we were saying, OK, we, how many more tightenings do they have left? Now, this year we're saying maybe they don't ease as much. And that's, that's different. And if I could just put a bow on the fourth quarter for a second, because I have the chance to and I'm so happy about it, my favorite <laughs> portfolio, the 60-40 portfolio, Tom, up about 10% in the fourth quarter, and the three-month T-bill index up 1.3%. And that three-month T-bill is still my biggest competitor. It's not Fun Family X, it's the three-month T-bill. The 60 and the 40 is not meant to work at the together. same time, though, right? But when they go up together, we're happy. Oh, yeah, when they go down course, together, we're really upset. That's the problem. But you're <laughs> saying now, as we come into this year, we might yeah. see a difference. You're saying defense is yeah. back in bonds. That's right. What's changed? That's, what's changed is the fact that, again, that, that primary risk of is inflation a problem, is the Fed going to raise rates, has now shifted to the fact that they're worried about their dual mandate. Their dual mandate is full employment and price stability. And it's, and it's a departure, John, from where we were from March of 22 when they were playing catch up on, on inflation. Core PC is at 3.2%. So given the fact that you have the biggest overweight position in yeah. equities right now yeah. since before the Fed started its yes. rate hiking cycle, are you basically viewing that the sell-off right now as a buying opportunity, or are you basically seeing this as something you want to wait through yeah. before adding more? So, Lisa, I think, I think you'd find some sympathy to this. Rates are on the wrong side of 4% right now uh, in the 10-year. So uh, I think there is some sort of you know, realization here that maybe we overdid the easing, and there could be some near-term volatility on equities. But that's noise. 
The real signal is the fact that the U.S. economy is on strong footing. We think the soft landing, I think the, all the pessimists has finally thrown in the towel on the recession in 2023, being that we're in January of 2024 now. So I, uh, that's, that's, that's where we stand here. It's not, it's not that the equity market is going to suffer from a growth story or a huge labor market slack or business caution. I think it's just the fact that it overdid it a little bit on the rate side. Ten-year notes should probably be, be between four and four and a half percent in the first quarter, and then maybe the equity market gives a little bit back there. Given that it might be a more of a rate story than anything mm -hmm. else, it's notable to me that tech is underperforming as much as it is, and yeah. it raises this question about whether you could have the recovery that you talk about and an underperformance on the index level mm -hmm. because big tech doesn't cooperate. Do you think that that could be something that happens this year? I think that could have some legs, Lisa, for sure. So if you look at the cap-weighted S&P 500 valuation at 19 times, Equal weight is at 16 times. So we believe that if you're now in a, you know, everybody's worried about high for longer, high for longer, high for longer. Now it's high for not that much longer, right? All of the S other S&P 500 companies that were worried about two things last year, recession or high interest rates, those companies are going to have a chance. Those are the companies we're focused on, Lisa, whereas the big tech companies benefited in March from Silicon Valley and the regional bank crisis, because Apple doesn't need a loan from regional bank, from regional bank, and they benefited from the fact that they have tremendous free cash flow that was generating all that income and they have a higher quality. So I think there could be a rotation and we're positioning for that. Okay, but the, the rotation, this is really critical. You yep. mentioned the 60-40 triumph beating by 900 basis points, 800 yep. basis points. Your bogey, that's all great. Except to most of our viewers and listeners, Apple is the portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean, even yeah. if they don't own it, mm -hmm. psychologically, that's a bogey. The Magnificent Seven, does that idea just go away? You know, it doesn't go away because those are really high quality companies, Tom. So it, does, it obviously doesn't go away. I just don't think it takes the leadership this year that it did last year because the fundamental story has changed. Folks being worried about high interest rates and, and free cash flow to now you have chances like, you know, financials in your last segment, I think, was a great cyclical story that was under owned this year. Things like that can make more sense than the Magnificent Seven. Those companies don't go away. Well, you set this one up for us. This is an easy one. It's that financials ex JP Morgan because JP I Morgan's done really well. Rude. I know you can't do this. <laughs> JP Morgan's done really well. The rest of the sector struggled. It's been a struggle. Why is that going to change? Yeah, and I think that was more around the fact of do we have a recession? Right. And I think in, in one of your last segments, I think it was a really good, good story in a risk on trade. Banks usually do well. OK. And I think that's what we're seeing, what we're trying to set up for in 2024. This all goes back to the factor. Are you in recession or are you not in recession? And we have a very low probability of recession this year. And, and the unemployment rate, we think, stays at around four percent. That should be good for banks. Let's finish on earnings if we can. Yep. So your earnings come out in a couple of Fridays. We won't talk about that, of okay. course. JP Morgan just around the corner, by the way. And then we're going to get the tech players, the likes of Apple in early February. Yep. What are you looking for for the fourth quarter as we hear from those companies in the next couple of months? Yeah, so I think our earnings estimate, John, for this year is about 10 percent on earnings. And I think that what we're going to hear from these companies is, I think, a little bit of a sigh of relief on the rate side. And I also believe that the U.S. consumer continues. You know, you mentioned ISM services. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, ISM manufacturing, you look, <laughs> you ask people, you know, that have been around for a long time, they think that matters. It's, we are a service sector economy right now. So I really believe that they're going to be focused on the consumer in the fourth quarter. That's held up very, very well. Phil, good to see you. Happy Great New Year. You Thanks for coming on. Phil Comparelli there of J.P. Morgan <laughs> Asset Management looking, Tom, for a change of leadership in 2024. Well, there's a, a zillion opinions out there, but the basic idea to the select few that own the Magnificent Seven, I'm not one of them, but the basic idea is if you own them, what do you do? Do you walk in and sell them? You're going to tell somebody to sell Microsoft right now? I Yesterday they were selling them. <laughs> they they were selling them. I believe they're right. selling them today as well. Yeah. If you aren't just joining us, welcome to the program. Here's the state of play, the scores, if you will, on the S&P 500. Pulling back, we're negative here by 0.4%. Yields are a little bit higher by four basis points, 397 on a 10-year, getting closer and closer to 4%. In about 17 or 18 minutes' time, we'll catch up with Torsten Slock of Apollo. Lisa, that conversation just around the corner. I'm curious to see about some of the softening uh, that we were hearing about from Tracy McMillian of uh, Wells Fargo. This question of, is it enough to both bring inflation down, but also support some of these pretty robust profit expectations and the sort of rotation that people are talking about? I mean, right now, the economics is uh, really going to be front and center. And you asked the most important question, which is, which is going to be the indicator that you need to follow that's going to be actually signal and not noise? Well, in the last 12 months, it's been jobless claims, Tom. 
any reason for that to change anytime soon? Yeah, I'll go with the jobs claims. To me, it doesn't have the depth of some of the other statistics. To me, the fundamental issue, I think of Tom Purcelli here of PGM, is the wage dynamic in America. It really, it, it's, it's better, but it really hasn't broken down. We're not beyond the pandemic wage surge that we saw. And that's the Neil Data call, ultimately, yeah. real wage growth. It's going to support the consumer, and this economy is the consumer. And we saw that in discretion going into year end. Some big names had some big moves. Thinking about the airlines, also really strong finish to 2023. Coming up very shortly, Henry de Trays of Veda Partners. That's coming up next. The broader price action, as you know, pulling back yesterday, pulling back again this morning. We're down by 0.4%. Session lows on the S&P 500 after some pretty stellar gains through 2023. Gains of more than 20% on the S&P, more than 50% on the Nasdaq 100. From New York, this is Bloomberg. The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December jobs report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. People are not particularly pleased with neither the options they have, how the parties operate, or how the system operates more generally. Looking at the favorable ratings, which is really a really good proxy, I think, at this point of the contest to see who's gaining traction with the public, really none of them are. Nobody's really shot through the roof um, and impressed or wowed. Of course, January 15th is just down the street. Yeah. Um, a lot can change, particularly when those first results start coming out from the caucuses. But right now, nobody's dominating. That was the brilliant Mohammed Yunus, the editor-in-chief of Gallup, speaking on Balance of Power yesterday on the mood of the American public as we enter a presidential election year. This line from him, Tom, jumped out to me. If you look at favorable ratings, which he says is a really good proxy, I think at this point of the contest to see who's gaining traction with the public, really, none of them are. Yeah. None of them are. There is a feeling across this country, away from the fringes and the extremes, and you just go to the centre, Tom, a great disappointment at the candidates on either side that are going to be facing off potentially for the president of this nation at the end of the year. We've faced this many, many times across 250 plus years. And the answer is there's a point where negative ratings really, really matter. And as we get towards the election, the primary season beginning in New Hampshire and Iowa, Amory Horton leading our coverage on that. And the bottom line is, is we're into the season where the negativity needs to be measured. Well, to me, what I find interesting is because of the sort of disaffection of both candidates, no one's really talking about the fact that we are less than two weeks away from the beginning of the election season where we have the Iowa caucus, the Republican agree. Party. Yeah. And then 10 days after that, we have New Hampshire, where suddenly we get a real read on what the landscape is going to be, whether Nikki Haley actually can gain any traction whatsoever on the Republican side uh, and President Biden, what kind of feel there is there. No one's really talking about the challenges of former President Trump to some of these bands. I mean, there are a lot of things going on under the surface and people seem to be shrugging it all off. It's like right here. I talked about <laughs> I, I talked about the response from market participants, that line from Laurie Calvacina, the conversations, Tom, about the US presidential elections for people in markets right now. It's like staring at the sun. It's like staring at the yeah, sun. Yeah, I like that. Frankly, I like it. And, and to the least point, I think this is important. There, there's, I don't see a drum roll to New Hampshire and I don't know what that means. I really don't know how to interpret it. Let's get to it right now on the political season. Henrietta Trays joins us, economic policy research director at Veda Partners, knows where Concord, New Hampshire is on the map, the distinctions between Manchester and Concord. Hey, Henrietta, I look at the dynamic right now that John just, just talked about. I got a lot of retirements going on in Capitol Hill. What are we going to see in the first 90 days politically on Capitol Hill? Um, you're going to see a tremendous amount of activity and noise. We have two potential shutdown dates, uh, a looming sequester of 1% cuts to defense. Um, and then you also have, obviously, the start of the various trials for pre former President Trump, uh, the first midterms, uh, excuse me, primaries, and then also a deal on Israel, Ukraine and southern border aid. So there's a lot of policy. But I would maybe just interject a little bit. I think the opportunity for investors to learn so much in the next 90 days is being underappreciated. You have about a third of the country 
who's going to decide the election from the independents, undecided Dems who are maybe holding out for another candidate, and about 8% of Republicans. And they're all going to start making choices after the first three primaries. So this next two, two three-month interval is going to be such a momentum opportunity for either candidate. And what I've sort of stressed to our clients is that one of the candidates on the presidential ballot is at his floor, and that is Joe right. Biden with you negative 21, negative 27 per points down versus maybe his June polling on certain data metrics. And then there's former President Trump, who's at his ceiling. So as we go into the next, in the first quarter of this year, which candidate would you prefer to be? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for read through uh, and forecasting that is pretty stark. You, you know, you earmark uh, Super Tuesday in early March as being politically important. Just as a general statement reaching into the summer, do you have any idea what the conventions look like? Or will they be absolutely original in our history? Well, I don't think there's an opportunity for Trump to be ousted after Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, or South Carolina. And what we see from the Republican challengers is that they're sort of hanging on. And I think that the hope is that they get to the convention period this summer and maybe Trump's various four federal indictments, uh, excuse me, 91 indictments, four trials, um, improving economic data and maybe fall out from a scenario where Trump is front and center and Biden's approval potentially emerges as a positive, And then there's a party shift. I think that there is a very low odds that Trump is not on the ballot, either in the primary or in November and is the Republican nominee. But if there's any opportunity for change for Haley DeSantis or any other candidate, Chris Christie's obviously also trying to hang on there. Um, the next opportunity is not till the uh, conventions. And I think that presents an opportunity for it to be interesting. Um, but other than that, I don't see an opportunity for change from the Republican side. And Biden is the Democratic frontrunner. Henrietta, you mentioned all of the legal challenges to uh, Donald Trump. So far, that's all been a benefit for him from a fundraising as well as popularity standpoint. Is there any signal that could change? Well, you got to ask yourself, who is it a benefit with? Is it a benefit with Democrats? No. Is it a benefit with independents? No. It's a benefit with Republicans. So the shocker is not really all that shocking. Republicans support Trump, and that's what they're showing you. So as he becomes more embattled, he secures his foundation within the base. But that's not sufficient to win the election. You need the independents. One of the things I'd encourage folks to look at as we face the uncertainty of the trials is the fact that the Supreme Court has decided to weigh in on abortion <clears throat> this summer. So we're going to get additional inflection points that have for the last three years impacted the way independents and Democrats and Republicans turn out. And abortion, I think, overshadows any of the trial stuff, which has shored, as you point out, shored up Trump's base. Um, but that's to be expected. Republican voters love Trump and they exhibit that time and time again. I kind of smile when we talk about leadership change within the market composition because we're going to get such a massive leadership change maybe uh, in the United States. We get the first matchup rematch once again of two presidential candidates since 1956, I believe. Henrietta, how should the market be viewing this in any other way other than staring at the sun, as John was just saying? Well, again, I think that there is a lot of opportunity for um, directional indications in the next few months. We're going to get so much clarity in the next 90 days. Don't discount that. You know, one of the things that I recall having done this for a long time is in 2016, people were convinced Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee. And then in 2020, they were convinced Bernie Sanders was going to be the nominee. All the predictive data sites said that. And it's because there was a failure to read through to what the polling numbers are telling you. They're telling you right now people are open to another alternative. In three months, there's not going to be another alternative. So where do you see historically those voters going? to their base, but in this case, I would be talking about Democrats because Biden has the biggest gap within his caucus, but then also independents. Where do they go? Well, since 2016, they've gone to the Democratic Party. So you'd have to overlook 2018, 2020, 2022, and, and then assume that it would somehow be different in 2024. And that sort of defies logic. Well, let's finish on this question then and tell me if it defies logic to think about this. Do Democrats need a plan B? Uh, I, first of all, I don't think there is a plan B, so I, I doubt it. Um, in the scenario that they do, their convention would look a lot like the confusion and um, momentous occasion that I described for Republicans, where you have a Gretchen Whitmer or a Gavin Newsom sort of emerge at the last minute. Um, but uh, again, I think the investors have also overlooked the fact that the next in line is the vice president, and that's Kamala Harris. And so there would be a, a three-way race, I think, between those three candidates if you were to come to the convention for Democrats and need to have a new candidate. Interesting. Henrietta, thank you. And a happy new year. As always, good to catch up. Henrietta Trace there at Vader Partners. TK, your thoughts on that last question. Do we need a plan B?
Uh, it's a really sensitive question, and I think everyone awaits, and it's a calendar item. I can't emphasize enough where many of the questions that we have to the left, to the right, in between as well, are calendar items. And Lisa nailed it earlier, saying that the calendar's disrupted. For whatever reason here, I don't see the anticipation. Yes, Iowa, I get it, but I, I'm, I'm sorry, East Coast bias, New England bias, I'm focused on New Hampshire. And I'm sorry, the focus is not there as it's been in previous cycles. I wonder how much Henrietta's line is actually one that the White House is looking to as well, which is right now you're seeing President Biden's floor and you're seeing the former President Trump's ceiling. And that's going to shift over time. What happens if it doesn't? As she said, there is no plan B. Do they need one? Unclear. There isn't one, period, full yeah, stop. Yeah, if you ask them, they'd be like, we don't need one. Exactly. But I'm sure there's someone out there saying, do we need there one? There are a lot of people uh, saying yeah. that. Tom King with an East Coast bias. I'm in shock. Absolute shock. Oh, shock. Shocking. Tosin Slark of Apollo. Truth seekers. Coming up next from New York City. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Equities pulling back here on the S&P 500, just off session lows, no drama, a bit like yesterday, just adding to the losses of yesterday off the back of nothing really. On the S&P 500, negative by 0.3%, yields higher by four basis points, 397 on a 10-year. A little bit later this morning, we get some economic data, we'll get the ISM, we'll get some Fed minutes this afternoon, on to payrolls on Friday before we get there, we'll get some jobless claims as well. Get some Fed speak too, we're light on Fed speak this week, but here's a flavour of it, coming from the Richmond Fed press. President, Mr. Barkin, with this to say, a soft landing is increasingly conceivable, but in no way inevitable. Lisa coming on to say that demand, employment and inflation all surge, but now seem to be on a path back towards normal levels. This to me is maybe some mediocre pushback. You're not really seeing any kind of reaction in the market, but basically saying, look, pump the brakes. This isn't an inevitable kind of outcome at a time where everybody has priced this in to perfection. And that's sort of uh, the balance that we're going to hear in the minutes as well. Trying to introduce maybe, Lisa, Tom, some two-way risk to this conversation around rate cuts as we start yeah, a new year. That's a really nice way of putting it and that there's an asymmetry here over the last 90 days and certainly after Powell's extravaganza a few weeks ago. And the answer is yes, they want to become more symmetric about the outcomes. The headline here, no surprise, uh, Barkin saying, uh, you know, higher interest rates, more additional rate hikes that remains on the uh, table. So that's creating that symmetric approach that they dream of. Maybe dream is the operative word. And Mike McKee can talk to us about the dream for the year ahead. He joins us now, our international economics and policy correspondent. Mike, let's talk about the Fed speak, the minutes later, and the data as well. What are you looking for? Well, everybody is going to be looking for any kind of indication about timing of rate cuts and what they might <clears throat> say about the number of rate cuts. Barkin talked about that in his speech this morning and said that all of this is in the context of their forecasts being right. They put out forecasts for inflation and unemployment and growth. At the same time, they talked about the possibility of three rate cuts. And he says that uh, the rate cuts depend on the forecast being correct. And as you note in his pushback, he he says uh, to the uh, folks on Wall Street, I would caution you to focus less on the rate path and more on the flight path. Is inflation continuing its descent? So I think the uh, pushback idea is still mm -hmm. out there. The Fed trying to get everybody to, to realize that this is uh, basically data dependent. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what we get out of the minutes today, too. Mike, on Friday, when you lead our coverage here on the wall of data that we see to Barkin's comments, we're going to get wage inflation data. Is that disinflation right now? Are we seeing wage inflation come down? Well, we're not seeing disinflation. Really, what we're seeing is a very slight drop in the month over month gain, which because of the uh, higher Jo uh, payrolls uh, pay increases that people got last year is bringing the year over year level down. It's now around 4% and the Fed's looking for three to three and a half. So it's getting there. They don't seem to be too worried at this point about a wage push inflation coming up. Uh, they're more concerned about other aspects of inflation, which will make CPI next week very interesting. All I can say is I'm still looking at these barking, uh, barking comments and I keep thinking, John, the horse has left the barn, right? <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, he's trying to push back. 
and we're not hearing it in the market. The market's saying, okay, you can say that, nice try, uh-huh, and they're not doing anything. I mean, that's basically what I'm seeing right now. Did you see the Mike McKee tweet storm over the Christmas holiday? Did you see that? Mike McKee, do you want to tell people about it who maybe didn't read it or don't follow you on Twitter about what's happening right now, this tug of war between markets and the Fed? Well, I welcome everybody to go back and look at it uh, on Twitter or on threads. But uh, basically, to boil it all down, what the Fed does is put out a compendium of 19 different forecasts. And the, we pick the middle number. And that becomes the basically the, the, the median that everybody focuses on. But it's not a plan. It's 19 different forecasts. So you have to look at it in the context in which Tom Barkin is talking about it, that everybody says, here's what we think will happen. And if what we think happens does indeed happen, then this is what we will do, or this is what each of them would do. And if you look at the dot plot, and John, you and I have talked about this before, the dispersion of dots is still pretty wide for next year from six to uh, one uh, or none. And so uh, there's, there's not any certainty on the Fed about what they're going to do. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mike McKee, they're breaking it down for the Federal Reserve. You can think about it this for the forecast as well, Tom. The median always masks the bigger story. The range often of the Federal no, Reserve is pretty no. wide. It's pretty wide right now for 2024, yeah. just like the forecast for the S&P 500 year end. We can talk about the average, the median. At the high end, you've got 5,200. At the low end, you've got 42. We're talking about a 1,000-point spread. Off, yeah, I would say, and, and I think the pullover to the equity markets is really apt in that, we, you know, off of the pandemic, uh, we, we have just a, a great unknown out there, is how I'd put it, into all of our coverage, including, I believe it's January 11th on inflation. Uh, right now, our conversation of the day, synthesizing all this together, Torsten Stock is chief economist at Apollo Global uh, Management. Torsten, I'm going to pull in here a whole bunch of threads. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index is showing massive accommodation. And yet I look at the old LIBOR, the new SOFR, SOFR, and I'm seeing huge restriction within the short-term paper market, tensions on Wall Street, and the illiquidity on Wall Street. How, how urgent is it for the Fed to make some direction on a March cut or dare I even say a January first cut? Well, it has a number of different dimensions. First, there is the dimension on the real economy. It's clear that the Fed pivot has eased financial conditions dramatically. And this begins to run the risk that we might see a repeat of what happened after Silicon Valley Bank. Remember, Chris Waller just said a few weeks ago, the easing of financial conditions in Q2, that boosted GDP growth to 5% in Q3. Could we see the same now where the easing of financial conditions after the Fed pivot might actually be boosting the housing market, the labor market, services inflation, goods inflation? We are not out of the woods when it comes to battling inflation. So on the real economy, absolutely, the easing of financial conditions is very supportive. There are some issues when it comes to the plumbing, when the tightness, as you are highlighting, in very short-term markets, and the Fed for sure has to play this difficult talk of war between do we right. want to ease financial conditions on the real side or how much can we ease financial conditions in the very front end of the curve. But this is the challenge for the Fed at the moment that you're highlighting. Torsten, you didn't listen. They didn't respond to the idea of financial conditions. They didn't seem to think it mattered at all at the last press conference. Why should it matter now? I mean, were we going to actually hear them come back and say, actually, just kidding about that financial conditions question? Well, they were debating in October and September, well, maybe financial conditions have done a lot of the work for us. And now they are saying, well, maybe financial conditions, it doesn't really matter because it can fluctuate so much. So I still think that it's a little bit inconsistent what they're saying when the data dependency, it only talks about the real data, whereas the financial conditions impulse. If you take the easing in financial conditions that we have had since the Fed pivot and stuff it into FERPAS, the Fed's model of the US economy, you will get a boom of up to 1.5% growth over the next several quarters in GDP. It's going to be very supportive as a tailwind to the economic outlook. Although we did have uh, Gennady on earlier of TD Securities, and he said, even with this idea that inflation could remain stickier, that we could get this ongoing growth, the Fed could still cut rates and still be restrictive, given the positive real rate. Do you ascribe to that kind of thing, or do you think that this means uh, many fewer rate cuts going forward for the Fed? I think that's absolutely right. That We have, of course, for the better part of the last year, we have talked about higher for longer. Now the conversation is more restrictive for longer, because they can still be restrictive if inflation is coming down, because real interest rates is what matters. So if real interest rates are still positive as inflation comes down, the Fed can accordingly also gradually begin to lower rates. But note also that if you look at the outlook for SOFA futures, as also Tom was mentioning, you 
you still have that the bottom will still be around three and a half, four percent. So one very important conclusion for asset allocation is that we are not going back to zero. We have still higher for longer in the sense that the level of interest rates, the level of the risk-free rate on page one in your finance textbook will be significantly higher for the next several years than where it was from the period from 2008 to 2022. Let's try and get to the heart of what we're discussing here, the interest rate sensitivity of the US economy. Exactly. Now, what we've seen over the last two years is rates go up aggressively and not slow down the economy. And what you're suggesting is that as rates start to come in and financial conditions ease, that the economy picks up again. Can you help explain that to people, why higher rates haven't slowed the economy down, but easing financial conditions will boost it? Yeah, but what's very important in that debate, and that's also taking place on Twitter and X, of course, here at the moment, is that it is live very, very critically sophisticated important analysis. to remember that that is significantly a function of whether you talk about the interest rate sensitive components of GDP or the non-interest rate sensitive components of GDP. If you split GDP into the cyclical components and the non-cyclical components, the main component that is sensitive to interest rates is housing. And housing did respond dramatically to higher rates. So this whole idea that the economy didn't respond to higher rates, that's just completely wrong. Of course, the economy responded to rates. It was the interest rate sensitive parts that responded to rates going up. <coughs> housing started slowing down. But the non-interest rate sensitive components, in this case, travel, restaurants, hotels after COVID, had such a long tailwind that that more than dominated the slowdown in the housing market. So splitting that debate away from the academic textbook, which we all love, is so important because it becomes so critical critical to think about, did the parts of the economy that are sensitive to interest rates, did they actually respond and absolutely, in particular housing, capex, also commercial real estate, things that are sensitive to interest rates, they did absolutely respond to when interest rates went up. This is a fantastic explanation, so let's build on it. Let's project this out. What are the forecasts now for you for GDP in the next couple of quarters? We heard from the likes of Max Kettner of HSBC, who said the biggest risk right now is that we have to reprice rates again higher because exactly of what you're talking about. What are you looking for in the data? Well, if I type ECFC Go on my Bloomberg screen, I will see that over the next six months, we are very close to zero, 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 on GDP for Q1 and Q2. So the consensus answer to your question is GDP growth is continuously slowing as a result of the Fed's campaign of hiking rates. The new risk that has emerged is that because of the Fed pivot, that means that the interest rate sensitive components that were dragging down GDP for the better part of last mm -hmm. year, they might now begin to rebound. Housing, most importantly, Case Shiller is now up 5%. Case Shiller is a very important leading indicator for the OER, meaning the shelter components of the CPI, and shelter makes up 40% of the index. So that means that if something that makes up 40% of the index is about to rebound, we could come back right. to that discussion about maybe the rates markets will have to reprice to higher for longer and more restrictive for longer. I just looked at the two-year inflation adjusted yield. I haven't looked at it since time began. Nixon was president. And I can use the word never over 20 years. The integrand or the duration of a high two-year real rate we've never seen. We had a spike in 08 with the great financial crisis, but the sustained high two-year real yields are absolutely unprecedented for global Wall Street. How unstable are we right now? I would say, at least from a Fed perspective, if you just take the economic textbook out and think about what matters, it is absolutely, as you're highlighting, real rates. So real rates being at these levels would tell you that we're still in very restrictive territory. So the challenge here for the Fed is that they still want to have the soft landing, and we all want to have the soft landing. That would be the best outcome, of course, from so many dimensions. But what is beginning to matter is that they have now sucked so much liquidity out. We've gotten to a point where we are beginning to see some strains in the plumbing that you're highlighting. And that's why real rates it has a very significant different impact on the long end and what it means for the real economy relative to what high real rates means for the front end and what it means for financial markets. At Austin, this has been an absolute clinic. If you are just joining us, just to get you up to speed on the price action, on the S&P 500 right now, negative by 0.3%, yield to higher by four basis points, 397 pushing 4% on a 10 year. Torsten, if you had to take a guess year-end, and it is just a guess at the moment, but I'll make it easy. Fed funds year-end, five handle, four or three? I would say at this point, I'm more in the forehandle. Four. I think, still think we need to raise higher for longer because this whole back and forth where the pendulum swings and we suddenly ease financial conditions and we get the burst in growth like we did in Q3, we could get a burst in growth in Q2 also as a result of the easing of financial conditions. So I think we still have, first of all, the Fed pendulum swinging between dovish and hawkish and the Fed would probably say, or the FMC members that came out afterwards would say, this was not intended to be as dovish as the way the markets have interpreted it. And that means that for markets, it will still be a bumpy 
Bradley Road is not just, excuse me, hooray, hooray for risky assets. I think the risks really here are that we will still have a lot of challenges with inflation simply not coming down as quickly. Yes, the six months change looks good, but don't cherry pick the three months, six months, two months change. Do what the Fed is doing. Take the 12 months change. And what's that telling you? We still have a rough road ahead. So if they do cut, they call it what, fine tuning? as opposed to the start of a cycle? Well, I think that they will say, so that's why Barkin's comments today are quite interesting, that there is probably, as you are highlighting, some dots that are different places, having different views on what needs to be said. But I do think that once we get that boom as a result that's coming along of the easing of financial conditions, I think that we will be back to the pendulum swinging back for the Fed in a more hawkish direction. Love this, Torsten. Just fantastic to catch up with you. Happy New Year, sir. Thanks for having me. Torsten Slock of Apollo Global Management from New York City. Equities bouncing off session lows on the S&P 500 from New York. This is Bloomberg. Gen AI is going to make it easier to access more information faster. How do we think about all those things and where is that going to go beyond this? I actually am very bullish on technology because technology is an underpinning. It's not its own industry. It is a part of every industry and it's actually going to increase productivity and actually make our lives better. That was Deborah Liu, the Ancestry CEO, speaking with the brilliant David Rubenstein. You can watch the full interview tonight on the David Rubenstein Show. Peer-to-peer -peer conversations coming up a little bit later. Just want to check in on the price action for you as we kick off day two of trading for 2024. Your equity market on the S&P 500 pulling back by 0.4%, adding to yesterday's losses, turning 2023 to some extent upside down just for a brief moment. Yield tire again this morning by four or five basis points, 397.44 on a 10-year. The dollar showing a little bit of strength after a year of weakness. Tom, the Euro, 109.23. Deborah Liu is the civil engineer from Duke University with a lot of experience at Facebook and then recently to Ancestry. John, Ancestry, you of course know they show the entire criminal history of the Keene family. You can get it all laid out there uh, as you'd have you, like. Have you paid up for that? I, uh, yeah, I've paid up to find out how bad the ancestors were. David Rubenstein, what an interesting challenge to take all this new technology over to our ancestors. What is the Deborah Liu distinction? Well, Deborah Liu is running Ancestry, which is the largest genealogy company in the world. And she's got a really good technology background. And as a result, she's applying that technology to historical records. So uh, it's much easier than it used to be to figure out where your ancestors came from and how far back uh, you can trace that is really amazing. So many people have a real interest in knowing where they came from. Uh, who are their grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers, and so forth. And now you can do that much more easily than you could years ago. I'd suggest that they're all Baltimore Oriole fans as well. We won't go there today. David Rubenstein, if I look at what they're doing, part of it is an AI frenzy. In your discussion and in your work at Carlisle, is there part of AI that just seems to be a moment, a fad? Uh, this company, Ancestry, was started about 40 years ago, and they relied on typical genealogical records. But now with AI, they can feed into their computers much more information, much more rapidly than before. And as a result, what used to take nine months to feed into their computers, they can do now in maybe nine days or even nine hours in some cases. The result is that they have a very good ability to figure out where you came from. And for example, Tom, do you know where your ancestors are or where they came from? Well, they're, you know, the ones that weren't in jail. <laughs> Ross came over in handcuffs. I know that. The guy named Ross, it's my middle name, he came over in handcuffs. Well, David, aside from genealogy and the handcuffs of the uh, Tom Keene predecessors, the ancestors, I am curious about <clears throat> what this says going forward for a whole host of different companies that need to make serious investment in artificial intelligence in order to glean the benefits of this. Is this something that gets isolated into bigger companies that have the capacity to invest some real money? <clears throat> okay, every company in the United States and probably every company in the world is trying to figure out how uh, artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence particularly, is affecting their company. Uh, I know my company, we're looking at it everywhere. It, people are looking at it. Nobody knows uh, exactly how it's going to affect their company. If you go back to the dawn of the Internet age, many people made predictions about the Internet that were turned out to be wrong. Some turned out to be right. But Internet truly really changed the way we live and think and and, and exist. And I think generative AI will, and certainly will for a lot of these younger t companies as well, because now they can do things 
they didn't have the resources to do before because generative AI enables them to do things that they couldn't have done years ago without this kind of AI technology. So it is going to change the world, but nobody really knows how. Do you have a sense, uh, David, of which, especially from your seat at Carlisle, of which industries are uh, adapting to certain artificial intelligence efficiencies more quickly than others? Well, clearly the technology companies that have um, a lot of technology uh, people in their, in their uh, employment roles already and people that uh, are engineers, uh, people that, that really uh, live and die technology are probably at an advantage. So right now the companies that seem to be doing extremely well on AI are the large technology companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and so forth. But clearly there are going to be a lot of small companies coming along in niches that nobody knows exist today. For example, there are a lot of Internet companies that came along that weren't thought to be possible 25 years ago, and now they're dominant companies. Just think about this. Uh, 50 years ago there was no Google or, or Microsoft and so forth, and they, now they run our lives practically. Uh, David, I have to turn to Harvard. You have been a great supporter of the Harvard Corporation. Of course, your founding of the Harvard Global Advisory Council. There was Penn, then there was Harvard, there may be others. Please comment on the resignation of the president of Harvard University. Well, I am not now currently on the board of the Harvard Corporation. I was on it for six years. I became the chairman of the University of Chicago board, and therefore I resigned on, and retired in July 1. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's good that this has been resolved. It's sad that it, it happened this way, but I don't really have any inside information at this point. Uh, Harvard is an extraordinary university, and I'm sure it will uh, do quite well in the future. It's our oldest university, right. probably our best-known university, but I don't really have any fresh insights in it that I can give right now. I asked Chicago graduate Lisa Abramowitz earlier, let me ask you the same question. What is the University of Chicago getting right? Well, the University of Chicago has had a policy of not commenting on public events, so we did not issue a statement about what was happening in, in Israel. Uh, there was pressure to do so, but we've had a hundred year history of not commenting on public policy. We have an uh, open expression policy there, which is to say almost anybody can say almost anything they want on the campus, uh, obviously not to incite riots and so forth, but it's, uh, it's a different university than many others I've been associated with, and they, their policy is really being led right now by Paul Albasados, who is an extraordinary chemist who's now the president of the university. And so we haven't had some of the challenges that other universities have faced. And many people are now looking to the Chicago model to see whether they can adapt that to their own situation. David, this is kind of uh, perhaps a bit of a personal question, but it's something that I know is a big topic of discussion in my household, which is, do you find that the people who apply to your company uh, don't have the same kind of critical thinking skills that they have had in the past? Do you think that the higher education system is preparing kids in the same way that they did 10, 20, 30 years ago to do the work that you need them to do? Well, clearly, people coming out of colleges and universities today have much more technical skills than they did when I graduated from college and so forth many, many years ago. So I think the universities are doing a reasonably good job. Why is it that people from all over the world want to come to our universities? We have an extraordinary number of foreign uh, students who come to the, our universities. We don't see that many American students going to foreign universities. That's because our students are being well prepared here. But clearly, as a student, you have some responsibility to figure out what you want to learn and how hard you want to work. You can go through almost any college with taking very easy courses and not learn very much. Those aren't the kind of people that we want. But you do find dedicated people and, and who, who do have certain skills. What I look for is not technology skills so much, but whether people actually know how to read and write and have interest and intellectual curiosity, whether they have a capacity to work hard and whether they want to make something of themselves, not just get a salary. And have a conversation. Get on with your peers, your colleagues, just like Tom Keane, David. Just like TK. Yeah, joy. So yeah. likeable. David okay. Rubenstein. David, looking forward to the episode a little bit later. Thank you, sir. David Rubenstein Thank of the Carlisle Group and host of Peer to Peer <clears throat> Conversations on Bloomberg TV. The latest episode coming out a little bit later this evening. Just dead on that conversation, Tom. Absolutely brilliant. Bramo, particularly towards the end. What are we preparing this generation for? What are these academic institutions doing and how have they changed over the last 10 years? What's developed in the last 24 hours is just the beginning of that conversation and certainly not the end of it. Well, and to that point, this question of a focus on technical knowledge as the technicalities of our existence change so quickly, maybe it need to shift back to the basics of critical thinking. And that's something that has been increasingly a conversation. How do you do that at a time where uh, the technology is shifting a lot of the experiences? Yeah, the Vanguard on this is there. <laughs> 
there is a shift, <laughs> but I would emphasize that some of what you're talking about, Lisa, is, oh, this course is hard. And there's not enough of... That's a different conversation. I, I got an email. I got an email once from one of the offsprings, the middle child. She took microeconomics for three days. She emails me, this is really hard. And I said, yeah. yeah. And in microeconomics, you develop the critical thinking skills around dynamics, concept, ge geometry, blah, blah, blah. But the answer is, what you're talking about, Lisa, is like actually going to school and studying how strange hey this was fun it was nice to close out an hour with you yeah, it was really cool it's nice manis know. cranny holding down the fort on the open today by the way i'll go through the lineup the brilliant manis cranny sitting down on bloomberg tv with peter Cheer from academy securities pimco's erin brown patrick frizzetti of rose advisors all of that coming up in the next hour on bloomberg tv lisa and i are working on a special project over the next week there or so go. so manis cranny is going to hold down the hold down the fort so to speak tk over the next few days. Well, but they have Manus in as well. You know, I, I think he's killing it at 5 a.m. With Danny Berger. I'm not, I'm not here, but you know. I'm, I'm aware of that. Right at the end. Lisa but, you know, is too. You're barely present now. You get like 5.50, 5.52. To be fair, neither am I. Sure Still adjusting. All right. To a brand new year. <laughs> Brahma, this was great. Come it's on, a, happy new it's year. fantastic. From New York City, equity <laughs> futures, just near session lows. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>